Well, hello, Hearth and Homies. Welcome to this compilation of Mystery is My Hobby. This is volume two of our series. Now, this show was originally entitled Murder is My Hobby, and it premiered on the Don Lee West Coast stations. It was a regional show in 1945. And then later that year, it moved to the Mutual Network for a nationwide broadcast. Now, when it began its national run, the uh, sponsors weren't too comfortable with the uh, name Murder is My Hobby. So they went with Mystery is My Hobby. Glenn Langan played Barton Drake. And of course, we've taken this classic old time radio show, added some beautiful scenery, some relaxing imagery to bring you the OTR visual radio. Now, just before we begin the show, just want to remind you of the Johnny Dollar Club. Yep, in case you haven't heard about it, this channel is not ad supported, so we rely on viewers like you to help us keep this channel on the air. That's right, starting at just a dollar a month, you can join the Johnny Dollar Club, help support the channel, and you also get access to exclusive content. How do you join? Well, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. All you have to do is look for the links that are in the description, they're in the chat, and they're also in the comments. And you can choose either patreon.com or buymeacoffee.com. Click on one of those links and check out the different levels of support. Now, if you go to buymeacoffee.com, make sure you click on the membership tab. Now, another way to support the channel is you can also buy us a strawberry. <laughs> That's right, over at buymeacoffee.com, you can buy us a strawberry. And again, that link is in the description. It's in the chat and it's in the comments. So we thank all of you that are supporting the channel. We really appreciate it. But now let's get on with our show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Mystery is my hobby. Today's story took place here in New York when we last week. K.O. Brown, lightweight boxing champion, was defending his title against a virtually unknown contender named Lefty Ross. The inspector and I were lucky enough to get ringside seats. No doubt who that round went to, eh, Bart? Not a question, Inspector. Young Lefty Ross doesn't seem to be doing so well, does he? Well, I said right along the kid wasn't ready to meet K.L. Brown. Yeah, you're right. That fat head manager of his... What's his name? Uh, oh, Niall Sampson. Yeah. Uh, knows uh, as much about boxing as I do about flagpole sitting. <laughs> Was flagpole sitting the chief sport when you were a boy, Inspector? Oh. Look, Inspector. There comes Sampson now. Yeah. I suppose he's going to give young Ross some fatherly advice. Probably. You know, if I had Samson's re reputation, I'd crawl into a hole and I'd, I'd just pull it in after You don't think much of Samson, eh, Inspector? I'll say I do. Hey, hey, what's going on over there in K.O.'s corner? It looks as though a private fight of its own has started among the spectators. Uh-oh. Here comes a policeman. They'll have it sort of no time. Sometime, I'd like to go to a prize fight and see all the fighting done in the ring. <laughs> Uh, here we go, Inspector. Round two. Yep. Hey, you want to make a little side bet on who takes it right? Ten even says Lefty Ross takes it. Are you kidding? That's a sucker bet. Ten even, Inspector. Take it or leave it. Okay. It's a deal. Sucker. That's all right, you see. Hey, what's the matter with K.O.? He's laying down on the job. You've got that twisted, Inspector. Young Ross is waking up on his feet. Look at that. Hey, you bum! Get in there and fight! You tell him, Inspector, he needs all the support he can get. I got him. Samson must have given the kid a shot in the arm or something. Either that or Theo was up late last night. Don't look at that boy, son. Yeah. Come on, Lefty. My money's on you. What a sound. Chaos driving. This is something I never expected to see. You and two thirds of the crowd, Inspector. Look, Chaos down. He's out. Like a light. Get back to your corner, Lefty. Let the referee go. He's counting. He's counting. Don't worry about your dog. Stop Stop him. Him. Eight. Nine. Ah, 
didn't see it, I wouldn't believe. Wait a minute, there goes Lefty back to his dressing room. Hey, they're certainly putting him out of the ring in a hurry. Well, there isn't going to be any hurry about K.O. leaving. No. He hasn't moved since Lefty hung that right hook on his jaw. Come on, Buck. Let's get out of here. I still can't Wait believe... a minute, Inspector. Oh, all right, all right. Here's your dough. Never mind the dough. Look up there. Ah, uh, where? Oh, so you want me to look at my boy, eh? You got to rub it in, Inspector, eh? Inspector, huh? was more than knocked unconscious. Come on, man. Good gosh, you're right. Follow me, Bart. Hey, make way there, will you? Pardon me, Bart. Inside, you, you guys. Me, there. Here we are, Bart. Hang up under the rope. Great. Right. That's Doc Stanley bending over K.O. now. Yeah. By the expression on his face, I'd say things weren't so good. Hello. How's the story, Doc? Hello, Mr. Drake. Now, this is bad. K.O.'s jaw is broken. He's dead. Look, Bart. If you think you're going to smell a murder out of this one, you're crazy. The fact that Kale's jaw was broken is enough. Well, that's Kale's jaw was broken. That's the reason why I'm suspicious, Inspector. I don't get it. Look, if the kid could... This is Kale's jaw, then. Let's go in. Hmm. What? I'll take care of that. Open up. Come on. Come on. Open the door. They don't seem to hear you, Inspector. No, well, they better hear me. Hey, open this door in the name of the law. Over it there. Well, how do you like that? Who is it they want to know? The police! Open this door and... That's right, about time. Who oh, the devil... There's Lefty in the rubbing table, Inspector. Let's go over to Yeah. There's Samson with him. One side, Bob. Come on, Denton. What's on your mind? Plenty. What's the matter with the kid? Well, what do you think? A couple of rounds of being slugged by a pug like K.O. Don't do a kid like Lefty here no good. You mean that Lefty's up? He was out on his feet when we took him from the ring. Now, the look of those red welts on his body, he took more of a beating than I thought. Oh, hey, take it easy, kid. Take it oh, easy. Oh, You'll be oh. all right. Is You'll that the right. reason you uh, uh, hurried him out of the ring, Samson? Sure. Don't do no good to let them things get wrong. Oh, oh I figured right, eh? The kid wasn't ready to meet K.O. But you shoved him in just the same. He got in a lucky punch and... Take it easy, Flatfoot. You stick to your snoop and I'll stick to my prize fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what the devil reason you've got busting in here anyway? Plenty. Now, listen. Inspector, please. Samson, would you mind stepping over here in the corner a minute? Bring along those gloves, Inspector. Yeah. All right, Samson, let's go. Say, what kind of a gag is this? Look, I've got a tent to the kid. It'll be just as well if the kid doesn't hear what we have to say for the moment. Okay, okay. What's on your mind? Doc Stanley just finished examining Kale. He's dead. Dead? Hey. What do you mean he's dead? He stopped breathing. What do you think we mean? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's it got to do with me? What do you need to me for? K.O. died as a result of a beating he took from your boy, Samson. His jaw was broken. What do you mean beating he took from my boy? That's a laugh. <laughs> it was K.O.'s fight right from the first gong until Lefty got in that lucky punch. Yes, yes, it was. That's what made us think that something might be wrong. Inspector, have you examined those gloves? Yeah. They're okay. Nothing wrong there. Say, look, what is this? What are you examining the gloves for? If you think I had anything to do with this, you're crazy. Lefty couldn't hit anyone hard enough to kill him. Anybody know that? That's just the point, Samson. Lefty couldn't hit K.O. hard enough to kill him. And he couldn't hit hard enough to break K.O.'s jaw. That's why I think that K.O. was murdered. <laughs> Donna. Lefty, you, you didn't win. Yes, I won. I'm the new lightweight champion. Oh, darling. Darling, now we can... Lefty, what's wrong? But you haven't heard? Haven't I heard what, honey? Huh? I've just been sitting here waiting. K.O.'s dead. Dead? Darling, what are you saying? He's dead. He died because... Well, because I hit him too hard. <laughs> Honey, you're joking. How could he die because you hit him too hard? That's ridiculous. They think I had my gloves padded. They think I murdered him. 
They let me go because they couldn't turn up any evidence, but I can't leave town. The idea. Well, the very idea of thinking that you... They're coming up here to ask me questions. They, they think I did it. They think I'm a murderer. They... Oh, darling, don't. Of course you didn't do it. Of course you're not a murderer. I must be. They said Kale died from blows he received in the rain. He examined my gloves. They thought the gloves had been padded. Look, darling, be reasonable. You couldn't have hit him that hard. And even if you did, it wouldn't be your fault. Lefty, your gloves weren't padded. I don't know. I, I don't remember. It's all confused in my mind. Maybe they were padded. Oh, oh there they are now. I, I've got to get out of here. You're doing nothing of the sort. You stay right where you are. The silliest thing I ever heard of. Yes? Sorry to intrude, Mrs. Ross. You are Mrs. Ross, aren't you? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ross. If you're the police, Lefty has already told me. I'm Barton Drake. Me. This is Inspector Noah Dan. Hi. Hello, Lefty. Hello, Mr. Drake. Now, see here, Mr. Drake. It's utterly ridiculous to think that Lefty could yes, have Yes, yes, I know. We don't believe Lefty's capable of delivering a blow hard enough to kill any man any more than you do. But still, you've accused him of murder. Not yet we haven't, lady. It's like this. If K.O. died as a result of the blows he received, the gloves had to be padded. Padded? Yeah. Are you accusing Lefty of padding his gloves? What does Lefty have to say about it? Well, I don't know, Mr. Drake. I, I wouldn't pad them myself, but suppose someone else did. Someone else? That's a hot one. Look, son, don't stand there and tell us you wouldn't know whether or not you were wearing gloves with a hunk of lead in one of them. Well, I... I suppose I'd know. Sure you'd know, and the referee would know when he looked the gloves over. That's not... Just the point. The referee would know. Lefty, tell us exactly what happened from the time you left your dressing room until you returned there after the fight. Well, I don't know exactly what... That is, I'm not sure. Everything's so confused. You don't know. <laughs> now, look, son. You don't expect us to believe that. Then why not? Lefty was excited. It was his first big fight. Naturally, he's confused about what happened. You remember the fight, don't you, Lefty? Yes, I remember that. I remember taking a beating in the first round. I remember the roar of the crowd and Samson yelling at me, calling me a coward, telling me to get in there and fight. Then the gong rang, and I remember thinking it would have to be now or never. So you got in there and slugged, eh? Yeah, that's right. Lefty, or I mean, K.O. must have worked me over pretty badly. I, I guess I was out on my feet when they took me from the ring. I got in one lucky punch, and that was all. Well, I got to admit it was a beautiful sock. Now, me, I don't think you were so confused, Bob. I'm sorry, Inspector. I don't think he was. Huh? But look, Bob, if he can remember getting in there and Inspector, fighting... Inspector, I'm going to change my opinion about K.O. Brown being murdered. I think his death was accidental. Accidental? Yes. Tell me, Lefty, this was to be your last fight, wasn't it? Well, yes, Mr. Drake, well... That is, if I lost, it was. Mm -hmm. And you had every intention of losing. I mean, by that, you knew you weren't ready to meet K.O. And you didn't think you had a chance of licking him. That's right. Samson didn't think so either, but he offered me big money to take K.O. on. Look, Lefty and I want to buy a farm. Neither of us have any relatives, except Lefty's brother, Mike, who isn't much good. Fighting was the only way Lefty knew of earning enough money before we got too old. You can't blame him. I'm not blaming him, Mrs. Ross. One more question, Lefty. Suppose K.O. hadn't died. Suppose you just knocked him out there by making yourself champion. Would you have stuck with Samson? Well, if I got to be champ, I don't suppose I could have let Samson down until after I had at least one more fight. Exactly. Inspector, I think we'd better get down to Niall Samson's gymnasium. We're going to work a little bluff on Mr. Samson that should definitely pay off. <laughs> Still snooping around, huh? That's right. Still snooping around, Samson. Well, are these two hairy gentlemen your bodyguards? That's it, Drake. My bodyguards. They get paid to see that no harm comes to me. You understand? Yeah, perfectly. Drake, you're smart. All right, boys, relax. Now, uh, what's on your mind, Drake? A little matter of murder, Samson. That's rather a new line for you, isn't it? Let's say it's out of my line entirely, chum. I see. Meaning, of course, that you didn't murder K.O. Brown. I didn't lay a hand on him. And I can prove it. Can you prove that you didn't pad one of the gloves worn by Lefty Ross with a pair of brass knuckles or worse? Ah, that's a laugh. 
I suppose next you're going to tell me I had the referee in my train. I think you would if you could, Samson. Failing on that, you resorted to the next best thing. You patted the glove yourself. You did it between round one and two. Sure, just walked up, stuck a hunk of iron in a glove with everyone looking on at No me, one yes? was looking at you, Samson, because everyone's attention was attracted to the fight among the spectators that started near K.O.'s corner. You're reaching for something that ain't there, Drake. Can I help it if a couple of drunks get to slapping each other around? You helped this one. You paid the drunks to do it. Inspector Danton just took them down to headquarters where I feel reasonably sure he'll persuade them to confess. What? Why, you two? Well, now that we've cleared up that point, perhaps you'd like to confess to Petting Lefty's glove. Look, Drake, you're too smart for your pants. Why don't you go have a talk with Lefty? Uh huh. I just came from there. And I suppose he told you that between round one and two, I come up and stashed a slug in his glove. No, I'm sorry to say he didn't. Which blows your theory wide open, don't it? Listen, that kid's on the level. He wouldn't let me pull a fast one like that even if I wanted to. I'm quite aware of that, Samson. That's the reason I'm going to hunt through your desk for a bottle of scopolamine tablets. Are you saying I drugged a kid? That's what I'm saying, Samson. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I drugged a kid so he wouldn't know I was loading his glove. But he was still in good enough condition to knock out K.O. You sound triumphant, Samson. Yeah, triumphant. Yeah, that's a, that's a good word. I think you're a little bit wacky if you expect anybody to believe that crackpot story. Now get out of here. I got things to do. I'm afraid you'll have to postpone the things you have to do, Samson. Keep away from that desk, Drake. Afraid of what I might find, Samson? I'll tell you how afraid I am. Boys, lock the door. I wouldn't do it, boys. Inspector Danton will be back here any minute, and he won't be alone. So what if he is? I'm telling you to get out of this office or else. Sorry, Samson. You've been training fighters for years. You ought to understand this. Boy. Oh, boy, you lousy. Get him, boy. Okay, if that's the way you want it, come on. Oh, you will, will you? Come. Get it, Tom. Oh. Open it. Open the door. Get it, Take care of Drake. Come on, boys. Let's get out the back door. What that don't know won't hurt him. Hey, you get back out of sight. Open up or I'm shooting this box of lasers. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Inspector. I'll let you in. Something. Judas Pod, look at your face. They did a job on you, eh? Yeah, yes, it feels that way, Inspector. Oh, well, what did you let them lock the door for? I uh, was busy at the moment. Well, anyway, the bluff worked. Samson thought sure as heck I was working over some of his boys down at headquarters. I'm afraid our bluff missed fire entirely, Inspector. What do you mean? I heard every word Samson said. The trouble is you didn't see what I saw. You see something special? Very special, Inspector. Just as Samson and his boys reached the rear door, it opened and a man came in. Samson yelled at him to get back out of sight. Well, who was it? Lefty Ross. <laughs> Those mugs had done something to your thinking apparatus. That couldn't have been Lefty Ross you saw. Well, possibly you're right about Lefty, Inspector, but there's nothing wrong with my thinking apparatus. Who are you calling? Every minute we waste here gives Samson more time to get away, you Samson know. Samson won't go far, Inspector. As soon as he realizes that running away will amount to confession, he'll be back. Hello? Hello, Lefty. This is Drake. Oh, yes, Mr. Drake. Lefty, have you been away from your apartment since Inspector Danton and I were there? No. Oh, Don and I have been right here all the time. Good. Now, listen carefully. Lefty. I wish I had your faith that that mug Samson would stick around when he knows. That's right, Lefty. Now, if you'll follow those instructions, I think you and Donna will be able to buy your farm. Do you think you can handle it, Lefty? Sure, Mr. Drake. We'll do anything you say. What time do you want Don and me to leave the apartment? Oh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Inspector Danton and I will have everything under control by then. Okay, Mr. Drake. We'll be there. You can count on us. Fine. Goodbye, Lefty. See you later. Well, Inspector, do you think my plan will work? It'll work as far as we're concerned, but suppose Samson doesn't play ball. He will, Inspector, I'm sure of it. We're giving him an opportunity to destroy evidence that will prove him guilty of murder, and I doubt if he'll fail the bite. Come on. Where are we going? We're going out the front door of the gymnasium and walk down the street, as though we were leaving the place for good. You figure that Samson's watching outside for us to do just that, eh? That's exactly what he's doing. As soon as he's sure we're gone, he'll return to his office. After all, he's, he feels reasonably sure that we haven't got a thing on him. Now, if he can destroy certain evidence that is probably hidden around this gym somewhere, he's going to feel pretty smug. Okay, I only hope those kids don't get themselves into a jam. They won't, Inspector. We're going to be on hand to see that they don't. Come along. Well, 
Lefty, what if Mr. Drake's plan doesn't work? Oh, it'll work, Donna. Drake knows what he's doing. It's the only chance I have of escaping a murder charge. Oh, uh, this is Samson's office here. Aren't you going to knock? No, I'll let's surprise him. Hey, what the... Oh, I just can't... And a little woman, too. Well, come right in. Come in. Hello, Niles. I dropped by to tell you I was quitting the ring. Oh, you did? Now, just a minute, kid. You ain't walking out on me just when I made you champ, are you? Yes, I am. That fight wasn't on the level, and you know it. You better back that statement up with a few facts, kid. I don't like it. I didn't think you would, Niles, so I got the facts. All the facts I need. Yeah? Such as what? Well, I talked to some people who saw the fight. They said I took quite a beating in the first round. They said it? <laughs> don't you know yourself what you did or not? No, I don't. That's what I wanted to ask you about, now. Everyone I talked to said K.O. Lamb basted me all over the place. They said that mostly he went after my face and head. Is that a fact? Yeah. And when I heard that, I began to wonder why I didn't have any marks or bruises on my face at all. Oh, so that's it, huh? Well, now, ain't that a shame? It is just a lucky thing my boys are here. They can just take care of your predicament without no trouble at all. Uh, boys, uh, the kid here figures he ought to have some marks on his face and head to show he's been in a fight. Lefty, look out. They're going to beat you. Now, now, Mrs. Ross, don't you worry. My boys will give Lefty what he wants, and then we'll all sit down and have a nice little talk about whether or not the kid's going to walk out on Niall Zemption. No, no, leave him alone. Give it to him, boys. He asked for it. Keep away from you, Mr. Get out. Get out. Get away, Paul. Sit still, Samson. Bart, go over there and frisk him, will you? Glad to, Inspector. Hey, what is this? What's the idea? In case you're really wondering, Samson, we'll let Lefty's brother Mike give you the details. But why, you... You can't prove a thing by him. Not a thing. What's my brother Mike got to do with this, Mr. Drake? Quite a lot, son. It was Mike who fought K.O. Brown yesterday, not you. But that's impossible. No, no, that's not as impossible as you might think, Mrs. Ross. You see, before the fight, Lefty was given a scopolamine tablet. Scopolamine? What's that? It's a new drug, Lefty. It puts the patient in a semi-conscious state. Some psychiatrists use it as a, sub a substitute for hypnotism. Well, I can't believe I wasn't actually in that ring. You don't remember the fight? <laughs> you said to yourself. Well, it's, it's all confusing. I'll tell you why you can't remember it, Lefty. Samson had a loudspeaker rigged up in your dressing room. You heard the fight, and Samson kept yelling at you to get in there and slug. And someone else kept whacking you with a wet towel, which accounted for the wealth on your body. It was your brother who was actually in the ring. He looked enough like you so that no one noticed the difference. And between rounds one and two, Samson came up and padded one of Mike's gloves while everyone's attention was attracted to the fight near K.O.'s corner. Mike had been training for weeks. It wasn't much good, but he had enough stuff to last two rounds, which was all Samson wanted. Yeah, but why? Why did Samson go to all that trouble? The answer to that is obvious, Mrs. Ross. Lefty was going to quit the ring, but Samson knew if he won the championship, he'd feel morally obligated to stick for at least one more bout. And maybe Samson could work the same gag again. Okay, boys, you got me. That's just the way it happened. I should have figured I couldn't get away with it. Huh? What? Did you hear what I heard? The um, guy actually admits it. I uh, know what I'm with, Stanton. I got that box of scarpola made bills in this drawer in case. Watch him, Inspector. There's a gun in that drawer. You bet there is. Take care of Drake, boys. The boys better take care of themselves and Drake. Get the floor. Get out of here. Here, Inspector, the Rosses live in that apartment house. I know it. I've been here before. Yes, that's right. I don't know how Lefty and I can ever thank you two for all you've done don't for try, me. Mrs. Ross. It's the sort of thing that the Inspector and I enjoy. Hey, eh, Inspector? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> we had a heck of a time. Say, uh, uh, look, Bart, uh, I've been figuring... Just a minute, Inspector. Huh? Were you going to say something, Lefty? Well, yes, I was. Well, what if no one had noticed, Mr. Drake? Well, I mean, Samson never let me have much publicity. You suppose he, he was kept trying... you undercover on purpose? Yes, I do. The fewer times your picture appeared, the less likelihood of anyone recognizing Mike when he stepped into the ring. Ah, I guess you're right. Mike and I look almost exactly alike. Did you know it wasn't me in the ring, Mr. Drake? No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. Oh, then how did you guess? What uh, gave you the idea that something was wrong? It was your name, Lefty. 
My name, of course. You got your name for being left-handed, didn't you? Yes, I did, but... Cale Brown was knocked out by two rights to the heart and a right hook to the jaw. That's it. That's what I was trying to figure out. But hand me over ten bucks. Ten bucks, Inspector? Sure, you bet me ten even on that second round. I don't understand, Inspector. I bet you ten even that Lefty would take the second round, remember? Well, sure, I remember. But Lefty didn't take it. It was his brother Mike who took it. You proved it yourself. Now, give me my ten bucks. Oh, 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 you will. All right, you got me, Inspector. I stuck <laughs> punching out on that one. Here you are. Thanks. Glad I happened to think of that. Uh, by the way, Bart, uh, there's a fight at the gardens next week. So? Now, look, I'll bet you 15 uh, bucks. No, on you this. don't, huh? Inspector. Not a chance. From now on, I'm betting on only one thing, huh? and that is... Mystery is my hobby. <laughs> Mystery is my hobby. I received an urgent request by a Mr. Tracy Winthrop to visit him at his home on the Hudson. My interest was aroused because of certain enclosures contained in the letter. So I called Inspector Danton, and we started north late that evening. Well, here we are. I'll ring the bell. Stop! Jump in, Judas. What's that? There's someone over there in the shadows. He who rings that bell is doomed. Hey, Bart, that sounds like a voice from the grave. Oh, stop using your imagination, Inspector. Hello? Is someone there? This is the house of doom. Enter not or you die. That's straight from the shoulder talk, Bart. Let's enter not. Keep quiet, Inspector. Hello? We're looking for Mr. Tracy Winthrop. I thought I heard voices out here. Is there something you wanted? Yes. Are you Tracy Winthrop? I'm Barton Drake. Drake? Well, I didn't expect you until tomorrow. Yes, I'm Tracy Winthrop. Come in, please. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Winthrop. There was someone there at the end of the porch who spoke to us. We're curious to know who it was. Someone spoke to you? Yes, that's right. Well, in just a minute, I'll turn on the light. There. Well, the porch seems to be empty, Mr. Drake. Yes, it does. That's odd. Odd? It's downright impossible. Look, Mr. Winter, both of us heard a voice. Really? I'm sorry, Mr. Uh... Oh, excuse me. This is my assistant, Noah Danton. Noah, Mr. Tracy Winthrop. Nice to know you, Inspector Danton. I read a lot hey, about Inspector, your work. Inspector, look. How did you know I'm Inspector Danton? Bart and I thought... <laughs> oh, come now, Inspector. When I asked Barton Drake to take my case, I hardly expected him to arrive without you. After all, it's a well-known fact that Mr. Drake considers you indispensable. Well, now, Bart, did you hear what the man said? I certainly did, Inspector, and he's 100% correct. Well, 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 I always thought... Now, if you gentlemen are convinced there are no spooks licking you on the porch, uh, will you step inside, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, but look, uh, that voice... Uh... The wind plays peculiar tricks at Hurricane Manor, Inspector. Often we mistake its howling for the whispering of voices. Whispering? By golly. Uh, step into my study, please. This is the only room in the house that's soundproof, so we can feel quite free to talk without being overheard. I'll turn on the lights. Hey, Bart, are we nuts, or did we hear a voice out there on the porch? Of course we did, Inspector, but for the time being, I think we'd better pretend it was the wind. There we are. Now, sit down, gentlemen, and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Say, it's kind of nice in here, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's the only room in the house I've been allowed to fix up to suit my own tastes, Inspector. Allowed to fix up? <laughs> I thought you were... Yes, uh... yes, I know. You thought that being a millionaire, I would be master of my own home. Unfortunately, I'm the victim of uh, circumstances. Oh, what kind of circumstances, Mr. Winslow? Women. Women? Yes. Two nieces and a stepdaughter. One of them is planning on murdering me. That's a pleasant outlook. And what does one of them want to murder you for? My money, naturally. You see, in my will, I've left everything to my stepdaughter, Lucy. Mm Mm-hmm. And you think it's Lucy who's planning your murder? Oh, no. No, why should she? Lucy has no way of knowing that she's my heir. So, to your nieces? I think they suspect. Mr. Drake, I'd like to appoint you as Lucy's guardian. What? Well, 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 that's a new one. Uh, How old is Lucy, Mr. Winthrop? Twenty. She's very attractive. (laughs) I'm sorry, Mr. Winthrop. Acting as guardian to an attractive girl is a little out of my line. Uh, Please hear me out, Mr. Drake. Lucy is, shall we say, not a very strong character. She's rather shy and retiring. As soon as I'm uh, dead, my two nieces are going to try and influence her to turn my fortune over to them. You seem very matter-of-fact about all this, Mr. Winthrop. Cold-blooded murder isn't something that should be spoken of so lightly. I'm sorry, but being practical in this case is being smart. 
I know I'm close to death. I want Lucy's interest protected after I'm gone by someone of good sense. That's why I've taken legal steps to make you her guardian, Mr. Drake. I'm afraid you took too much for granted when you assumed I'd accept the guardianship of your stepdaughter, Mr. Winthrop. On the contrary, I rather think you will like the idea. I believe it appeals to you because... uh, it smacks of danger. Danger? What's dangerous about playing nursemaid to a 20-year-old babe? I explained all that in my letter to Mr. Drake, Inspector. That's why he indicated his willingness to do what I asked by cashing the check I enclosed. Now, wait a minute. Just what did you explain in the letter? He explained, Inspector, that there was a possibility of my being murdered. Yeah, you mentioned that. Why is there a chance of Bart being murdered? Because, Inspector, after I'm gone and it becomes known that Mr. Drake is Lucy's legal guardian, somebody's going to try and dispose of him. I don't believe it. Those things only happen in books. Now, Please, uh, Miss Howells, Martin Drake, or you die. Good heavens, what's that? It's a voice of death. Where did it come from, anyway? Behind you, Inspector. Behind me, I don't see. It says the house of doom. Leave before it's too late. It didn't come from behind me. It came from over there. It couldn't have. This room is absolutely soundproof. Tell me, is this the first time you've heard the voice, Mr. Winthrop? Yes, it is. I can't imagine what its meaning is or how it's possible for us to hear it in this room. Maybe it's a whispering of the wind. Is that... Is that what you meant when you said you heard a voice out on the porch? Yes. Are you convinced now that we weren't imagining things, Mr. Winthrop? Yes, I am. That was a real voice, though inhuman sounding. Drake, this could mean the beginning of the end for me. Why? What's the voice got to do with you? It was Bart the guy was talking about. But don't you see? Somehow they've learned that Drake is here. Perhaps they know that I've appointed him Lucy's guardian. They're trying to frighten him away. I think you're partly right, Mr. Winthrop. <laughs> Good Lord, listen to that. Sounds like the voice of death got it herself. Yes. I think we'd better find out where that came from right now, Mr. Winthrop. Will you lead the way, please? But the voice was right here in this room. Obviously, that's incorrect since we can see every section of this room. No, I think if we look carefully, we'll find a loudspeaker attached somewhere and a microphone in some other part of the house. Say, that could be the answer, could it? It must be the answer, Inspector. Well, Mr. Winthrop. All right, come along. We'd better search the bedroom first. The stairs are at the end of the hall. I'll switch on the lights as we go along. Stop. Death lurks at the top of the stairs. Beware. The guy must have a walkie-talkie. That came from over there. Under the stairs. There's nothing under the stairs. You can see there isn't. Mr. Winthrop. Where's the switch that will turn on the lights at the top of the stairs? Right there on the wall beside you. Hmm? Oh, yes, fine. I'll turn it on. you better get out your gun, Inspector. I've had it out for five minutes. Go ahead, switch on the light. God damn That's jumping, Judas. What happened? The lights are on. It's pitch dark. It's this sort of circuit. Mr. Winthrop. Inspector. Yeah, I'm right here. Hey, Mr. Winthrop. Well, looks like the old boys left us. He was right there when... Okay. What's going on? Get out your flashlight, huh? Inspector. Okay. Hey, well, you dirty... What's the matter? Someone knocked the light out of my hand. Well, pick it up. Okay, okay. i got to find it first. Doggone it. I, I can't see a thing. Wait a minute, Inspector. I'll light a match. What is that? Someone looked through that door at the end of the hall. Here's a match. There's your flashlight over against the wall. All right. Yeah, I got it. I can see something. Jump in, Judas, but look. Yes. I see it. Winthrop's body. His body? Do you mean... Look at his neck, Inspector. There's a strand of wire knotted around it. He's been strangled. Hi, golly. Let me take a look. You're right, Bart. He's dead. Murdered right under our noses. Yes, and quite cleverly, too. That wire had been fashioned into a noose before the... Look, 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 look. I see. Here comes the babe with a candle. Well, gentlemen... You seem to have done rather a thorough job of murdering Uncle Tracy. Murdering him? Us? Now, look, lady. You're Inspector Danton, are you not? This tall gentleman must be Barton Drake. That's right. And who are you, please? I? Don't you know? Well, I'm Lucy. Tracy Winthrop was my stepfather. You're Lucy. <laughs> and Winthrop must have been giving us a runaround. There's nothing shy and retiring about you. In the face of death, Inspector Danton, even the shy and retiring are strong. And then, of course, I'm crazy. Crazy? Yes. Didn't Father tell you? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm crazy. <laughs> I start staring mad. <laughs> Lucy, answer me. Yes, Cousin Mona? What are you laughing at? Who turned off the light? It's Father Tracy, Mona. He's 
been murdered. Murdered? What are you talking about? I knew I shouldn't have let that girl alone. Lucy, who are these two men? I don't know, Cousin Mona. I found them standing here over Father Tracy's dead body. Good heavens. He's been strangled. That's right, Miss Evans. You are Miss Evans, aren't you? Yes, I'm Mona Evans. Who are you? What are you doing here? And who's this other man? That is the name, ma'am. Inspector. Homicide. Inspector? Then that's why you're here, because Uncle was murdered. Tell me, how did you know? He was alive an hour ago. This is all so confusing. Won't someone kindly explain what it's all about? They killed him. I saw them. I was standing right there in the doorway. Oh, hush up, Lucy. Policemen don't go around killing people. Now go back to your room. But I thought... Go back to your room, I say. All right, Cousin Mona. Cousin Mona. She's no more my cousin than the man in the moon. Now that Uncle Tracy's dead, I'll have her committed to a home. You seem rather pleased that your Uncle Tracy is dead, Miss Evans. Naturally. Helen and I stand to inherit his entire fortune. Why shouldn't we be? Helen? She's my sister. Oh. We'll share Uncle Tracy's fortune equally. Where's this Helen now? She's up in Maine, visiting the family of a fiancé. Oh, dear, what a mess this is. I suppose you men are going to insist that Uncle Tracy was murdered? Yeah. That wire wasn't put around his neck for comfort. Furthermore, we're going to find out who murdered him. How annoying. Well, I suppose it can't be helped. How long do you think it'll take? Well, that depends on how cooperative you are, Miss Evans. By the way, who's that standing over there in the doorway? What? Oh, that's Grace our maid. What is it, Grace? There's something wrong, Miss Mona. The lights went No, and... there's nothing wrong at all, Grace. Mr. Winthrop has been murdered, that's all. Murdered? Yes, but don't worry. These gentlemen are here to find out who did it. You can go now. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Grace. Yes, ma'am? Miss Lucy will be leaving us tomorrow. You can help pack her things. Leaving? Miss Lucy? Yes. That's all, Grace. Yes, ma'am. Miss Evans. Yes. I dislike disillusioning beautiful women, but I'm afraid you're taking too much for granted. Oh? In the first place, you are our number one suspect. The idea. In the second place, you are not the one of the heirs to your uncle's estate. He left everything to Lucy. Nonsense. I've seen the will and it's properly... In the third place, I've been appointed Lucy's legal guardian and I don't believe she's crazy. That's ridiculous. Of course she's crazy. She's been crazy for years. Helen and I can prove it. And I can prove something too, Miss Evans. I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt who it was who murdered your uncle. Convinced that there aren't any loudspeakers or microphones here in Winthrop's study? Yes, Inspector. I'm afraid I'll have to admit defeat on that score. So the voice of doom really does come out of the spirit world, well, eh? Back to your sense of dramatic sometime proved to be the most ridiculous. Oh, hello, Miss Evans. Come in. Mr. Drake, if you're so positive, who murdered my uncle? Why are you going to all this trouble to collect evidence, as you call it? Knowing a person is guilty of murder and proving it are two different things, Miss Evans. And Drake doesn't go around putting the finger on people unless he can prove their guilt, lady, so you might as well quit playing hard to get along with. Oh, all right. What do you want me to do? First, I'd like to see your uncle's will, the one in which he names you and your sister Helen as his heirs. I see. You doubt that such a will exists. Very well, I'll show it to you. Uncle Tracy made no secret of it. He kept the will here in his desk drawer. Yes, here it is in the folder. Look it over, Mr. Drake. Thank you. Hmm. This is rather extraordinary. A will and handwriting. Uncle Tracy was an extraordinary man. The fact that the will is in his handwriting proves it's authentic. It might, if that's Winthrop's handwriting. Don't be absurd, Inspector. Of course it's Uncle Tracy's handwriting. A dozen people can and will swear to it. Tell me, is this the only will that your uncle ever made, Miss Evans? No. A long time ago, before Lucy became deranged, he made another, naming her as heir. Mm-hmm. And where is that will now? I suppose that attorney Scott Rowland has it in his office. But don't get any ideas. The will you have in your hand outdates the other by month. It's properly witnessed and otherwise quite in order. Now, what else would you like to know, Mr. Drake? Oh, quite a few things. First of all, the inspector and I would like to search your bedroom. My bedroom? Yes. Then we'd like to examine the cellar. The cellar? What an unusual request. Mr. Drake, are you quite sure you know what you're doing? Oh, very sure, Miss Evans. Furthermore, I'm quite sure that you know what I'm doing, too. 
Come along, Inspector. Here we are, Inspector. This must be the room. Yep. I don't know what you expect to find in the baby's bedroom, but... Hey! What? Oh, this is something I didn't expect to find. Were you looking for something, Grace? I... I was just cleaning up, sir. That's a good one. You always start cleaning up by looking inside of desk drawers? Uh, I don't know what you mean. What's that you're trying to hide behind you, Grace? It's nothing. Really, it isn't. It's nothing at all. No? Let's see here. Oh, please. I didn't mean to steal anything. Well, well, well. A book. Now, what the May heck? I see it for a minute, Inspector? Sure, it's sure. nothing but an ordinary book. Hmm. No, it's quite a lot more than an ordinary book. It's known as Evans' personal diary. Grace, what did you want with this diary? Oh, I didn't steal it. I didn't. I was only going to to dust it off. Dust it off. But when this babe cleans up a room, she really cleans it, opens drawers. I suppose and... you know that people who steal are sent to jail, Grace. Oh, I wish you would send me to jail. I wish you would. I hate it here. Hate it. Are you really policemen? Really policemen? Now, look, lady, this is the first time anyone ever asked me that question. Why are you so anxious to know if we're really policemen, oh, Grace? Because if you are, there's something I must tell you. This is the house of doom. All who come here must die. There it is again. The voice. Oh, I know that I'll be next. They told me I would if I... Oh, the voice. Oh, I know that I'll be next. They told me I would if I... If you what, Grace? I can't tell. I can't. I'll die if I do. They said I would. Who said you would? She did. The voice. She said that Mr. Winthrop would die, and then she said I would. Oh, I'm so frightened. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no need to be frightened, Grace. You're not going to die. I am. I know I am. I'm so afraid. Oh, no. no. Inspector and I will take you to your quarters, Grace, and you can lock yourself in your room until we get back. Where, where are you going? Down in the cellar. And when we return, we'll have the voice of doom with us. What are we stopping here in the kitchen for? I thought we were going down and trap the voice of doom. Hmm. Let me see. Hey, Bart. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, Inspector. We are going down and trap the voice of doom. But first I... I want to check through this diary. Why? You expect to find a confession of murder there? Oh, no, no, Miss Evans couldn't have had time to record the murder since it only occurred an hour ago. Be reasonable, Inspector. Okay, then what are you looking for? A confession of murder, Inspector. A confession? Now, wait a minute, Bart. All right, Inspector. I found what I wanted. Get out your flashlight and let's go. Looks rather forbidding down there, doesn't it? There's a light switch on the wall. Huh. No light? No, I didn't expect there would be, did you, Inspector? Someone in this household is mighty handy with electric wires. Point your flashlight down the stairs, Inspector. What are we looking for? That's what I want to know. We're looking for the door to the furnace room, Inspector. Yes, this is it, all right. Furnace, what are you going to do, start a fire? We might have to smoke out the voice of doom at that. Well, there's no furnace in here. No. Appears to be nothing but a store room. Hey, someone shut the door. Not only shut it, but lock it. Hey, that dirty. Hey, open this door. Open it. No use, Inspector. Whoever locked us in here intended that we should stay. So the great Barton Drake stepped into my little trap. <laughs> Where'd that come from? That creeping up to the ceiling, I think, Inspector. It's an air duct from a furnace. From the furnace? Yes. This house is heated with a hot air system, Inspector. Which means that there are one or more registers in each room. Now, any sound made inside the unlighted furnace would produce a hollow intonation which could be heard throughout the building. So that's where the voice of doom came from, eh? There's no doubt about it, Inspector. How very clever you are, Barton Drake. You fool. You were warned. Now you must die. Die, she says. What's she going to do, scare us to death? Nothing so naive, Inspector Danton. Listen. Hey, that sounds like escaping gas. Inspector, that is escaping gas. It's coming through that air duct. Well, of all the corny gimmicks. Hey, shut up the gas before I... Uh, <laughs> before I... Before you what, Inspector? <laughs> Don't waste your breath talking, Inspector. You need all you have before we get out of this one. Ooh, pull that box over here. Box one for... What are you going to do? I'm going to stand on it and stuff my coat into that air duct. Hurry now. Okay. 
Stuffing up that hole isn't going to keep all the gas from getting in here. I'm beginning to feel lightheaded already. But we're doomed. Nonsense. There we are. That'll keep most of the gas out. All right, Inspector. Start shooting. Shooting? Shooting at what? The lock, of course. Two or three slugs should ruin it completely. Oh, say, that's a good idea. Funny I never thought of it. Hurry up. Okay, okay. Here goes. That ought to do it. Better. I am beginning to feel lightheaded. Okay, Bart. Come on, it's open. Fine. Keep your flashlight handy, Inspector. The voice of doom must be somewhere nearby, and we're going to find her. There's a door over there. Maybe... Shh, shh. Listen. What'd you hear? I'm not sure. Come over this way. Hey, Bart, look. Yes, I see it. Behind that barrel. Come on, Inspector. No, you don't, sister. Stay right where you are. Grab her, Inspector. I'll grab her all I can. Let me alone. Let me alone. Help her, Judas. It's Lucy. Yes. Shy and retiring little Lucy. You let me alone. You can't arrest me. I'm crazy. Everybody knows I'm crazy. You're telling us. What's going on, though, dear? Lucy? Mona. Help! Help! I'm afraid your cousin Mona won't be of much help, Lucy. There she comes and the maid's with her. Lucy, what happened? What's all this shooting about? I think you know what the shooting was about, Mona. Oh, I do. Tell him I'm crazy, Mona. Tell him I'm not responsible for what I do. Before you answer that, Mona, let me tell you something. Well? In the first place, I'm going to ask Inspector Danton to arrest you for being an accomplice in the murder of your Uncle Tracy Winthrop. You what? And in the second place, I'm going to ask the Inspector to arrest this young lady here as the actual murderess. Wait a minute, Barty. You mean you want me to arrest this one? That's right, Inspector. But this is Lucy. She's the old man's stepdaughter. Also, she's crazy. I'm afraid you're wrong, Inspector. She's not crazy. In fact, she's not even Lucy. Huh? What was that by? The young lady's name, Inspector, is Helen. She's Mona's sister. And this girl here, who's been posing as a maid, is Lucy. Isn't that right, young lady? Uh, I'm not supposed to... Shut up, you. If you open your mouth, I'll... Uh, you won't do anything. Stand back and let the girl talk. Go on, miss. All right. I'll tell you. They threatened to kill me if I did, but now that father's gone, I don't care anymore. I'm Lucy. They made me pretend I was the maid. They killed father. They've been planning. Are you little wretch? I told you I'd kill you and I will. Put down that gun, Mona. Inspector. Yeah, I got it. All right, lady. Take it oh. easy. Let go of me. Let go of me. Hmm? Oh, yes, Grace. You, you can call me Lucy now. That's my real name. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. What was it you wanted, Lucy? Are you and Inspector Danton leaving now? Yes, we are. But don't you worry. You'll be all right. There's no one around to bother you now. But I... I thought... Yes? Well, if Father appointed you my guardian... I mean... Well, I hate being left alone and... Yes, and... I see what you mean. It wouldn't be quite right to leave you here... All alone, would it? Well, tomorrow I could go to Aunt Fulton's house and my best friend, and they want me to live with them. Okay, Bart, we're all set. Those two babes are taken care of, and I drove the car all the way up the hill. Hey, what's the matter? Uh, Inspector, uh, I was wondering... Oh, 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 you don't have to brag. I caught out of the gimmick almost as soon as you did. It was the book. Book? What book, Inspector? The one with the writing in it. The diary that the young miss here was trying to steal. Oh. Hey, by the way, what did you want to steal it for, miss? Well, you see, Inspector... I knew that Mona had been practicing Father's handwriting for months. I also knew she kept the diary, so I reasoned that the more accurate she became in writing like Father, the more the entry she made in the diary would resemble his hand. Say, you're pretty smart. <laughs> you figured it right. The last entries in the diary were written in exactly the same hand as that phony will. And that meant that Mona forged the will, didn't it? Right. They suspected that you knew what they were up to, so they forced you to play the part of the maid. And then Helen pretended she was me and tried to make you think she was crazy. And later on, they try to work it out so that I'd be committed to a home. That's it. There's only one thing I can't figure out. <laughs> Why did Mr. Drake here become suspicious in the first place? Oh, I know the answer to that. When Helen first spoke to him, posing as me, she referred to Father as Uncle Tracy. You see, I'd naturally speak of him as Father. Well, well, did you figure that one out, too? Oh, no. Mr. Drake told me. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> I'm glad you let me in on it. Bart would needle me about it all the way back to New York because I didn't notice. Hey, uh, Bart, yeah. let's get going. 
I'm going to be back in New York tomorrow. Sorry, Inspector. Now, what do you mean, sorry, Inspector? I'm leaving, but you're not. What the devil are you... We can't just go off and leave this little girl here by herself. One of us will have to remain until she can make arrangements with her friends. Well, now, <laughs> let's see how Guardian Drake is the boy. Guardian Drake is returning to New York, Inspector. As a policeman in charge of this case, it's up to you to stick on the job. Nothing doing. Look, I'm a cop, not a nursemaid. Hey, Bonnet, come back here. This is your job. Sorry, old boy, playing nursemaid isn't my job or hobby. Writing is my job and mystery is my hobby. And now to Glenn Langan as Barton Drake and the first act of Mystery is My Hobby. Why the good inspector had to drag me to the theater tonight of all nights is quite beyond me. I could much more profitably have been finishing the first chapter of my latest book or calling upon a very desirable young lady I know. Of course, mystery is my hobby, but that doesn't include magicians, charlatans, and mind readers. And that's just what this Rajah Vidrami is, I'll bet you. Even if he is billed as the greatest wizard of modern times. Well, this ought to be a good show, Brian. Inspector, you're getting tired. Certainly you don't believe in this stuff. Of course not. I'm here on business. Oh, you want to learn some card tricks? Now, look, Bart, you know the department frowns on these kind of things. We got laws about fortune tellers. I'm here to see that this guy doesn't pull any monkey business, that's all. <laughs> and incidentally, find out how your great aunt is doing in the other world, Inspector? Now, Bart. <laughs> Anyhow, they usually have some mighty pretty girls in these kind of shows. In tight. In tight. Now, be quiet. Here, here comes the man. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. To some of you, it may indeed seem strange that I appear before you in this unusual capacity, but I assure you, I am the same Dr. Tree who was your professor of psychology at the university. Hey, yeah, it sounds as if the guy might be all right, Brian. Right? Well, like a professor wouldn't give up a good job to handle a fake, would he? Mm, maybe, maybe not. I, I am convinced that the Raja Hanuman Vidrame has developed the ability to control his mind, as well as the minds of others, to an extent never before known to science. That is why I left the university a year ago, to enjoy the company of this great man. I therefore take great pleasure in introducing to you Raja Vidrame. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I am Raja Vidrame. During the evening, I shall attempt many experiments. However, the greatest one of all, will require the whole evening. I shall therefore begin it now. Loretta, if you please. You will become rigid, Loretta. Dr. T, you and I will bind her hands to her side. We will place the rigid body upon this bed of sharpened spikes. Strike them, Dr. T. I wish the spectators to know that they are real. Yes, Raja. We now place this sheet over Miss Loretta. Now, Dr. Three, you will cover her completely with sand to a depth of at least two feet. Ladies and gentlemen... You shall see at the end of this performance that despite a complete lack of air, when we uncover her, she will still be alive. <laughs> Dr. Three is now removing the sand. Buried in sand for two hours, you shall see that Miss Loretta still lives. You may remove the sheet now, Dr. Sweet. Miss Loretta. Miss Loretta. Dr. Sweet, please. She's dead, Raja. She's dead. Impossible. Loretta has been shot. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, a terrible tragedy has occurred. 
The girl we buried alive in the sand is dead. Not by suffocation. She's been shot. <laughs> I'll pick out a couple of men and put them on the stage door box. Then I'm going to call for a detail. Okay, Inspector. Raja, did we have the curtains closed, please? Yes. Yes. I attend to it at once. Well, Dr. Tree, something seems to have gone wrong. It's impossible. It couldn't be done. Death isn't very pretty, is it, Doctor? Raja can at least close up the curtain. The Raja can do anything. Yes, except bring this poor girl back to life. Help me turn her over, Doctor. Maybe we can find the wound. Uh, yes, of course. Ah, thanks. We'll set her down here, off the spikes. That's better. Yes, yes, indeed. It's, it's terrible, sir. A gaping hole in the back of her head. Hmm. Bullets still in the brain. It couldn't happen. It, it, it couldn't. Yes, yeah, but it did. Hmm. Let's take a look at this bed of spikes. Well, I... Uh, there's nothing... What's uh, this? What, sir? This bent metal tube running through the spike. There's a mouthpiece on the end of it. Well, it's... Uh, it's... Uh... There. I'll pull it out of the spike. <clears throat> well, this particular spike is hollow. There's a hole barred in the, barred in the stage just under it. There are two other holes, slightly larger, right alongside of it. Well, Dr. Tree, this exhibition was a fake, wasn't it? What do you mean? All the time the girl was lying buried in the sand, supposedly in a trance, she was breathing through this tube. But she had to breathe, of course. The whole thing was a fake. That's a funny thing, Dr. Tree. Even I was tempted to believe it was real, and you completely fooled the inspector. Well, why not? I staged it. So far, I've been able to fool all the great authorities. Yeah, well, never mind. Who was backstage, Doctor, during your act? Only the girl, Mildred, Raja's other assistant. You saw her yourself. Yeah, she was quite alluring. Uh, there's one thing I think you should know, Mr. Drake. Uh, this girl here, Loretta, is... was my wife. Very interesting. We've been married just a few months. And I see you're completely overcome with grief. Hey, Martin. Yes, Inspector. I've got guards on the doors and a homicide detail. I'll be here any minute. Good old Inspector. You follow the routine to the letter, don't you? You bet. Where's our friend the Raja? Did you let him go? I'll say I didn't. The Raja couldn't possibly have committed this crime, gentlemen. He was on stage during the entire performance. Mm -hmm. Where is the Raja, Inspector? Downstairs in one of the restrooms. Perhaps we'd uh, better go have a talk with him. Hey, hey, what's that? Who's shooting? Come on, let's find out. Give me that gun. Who's in there, Mildred? Man, I don't know who, but he ran back of the mummy case. I'll in there. Him out. Wait a minute, Bart. Let me get him out. Okay, Inspector, go ahead. Come on out, you. Come on or I'll shoot. Come out of that box. That'll get him. You're so thorough, Inspector. <laughs> hmm. Nobody in there. I'm sure I saw somebody. I'm sure I did. Hey, what was that crash? Where's Dr. Tree? How do I know? He was just here. I'm afraid this little pretty has tricked us, Inspector. She's distracted us long enough for Dr. Tree to go downstairs and conceal some evidence. Well, Dr. Tree, coming up again? I, I was down here looking for evidence. Uh-huh. And uh, why did you expect to find some evidence down here? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Loretta was killed while she was lying on her back, buried in the sand. She was hit in the back of the head. This is the only place the shot could have come from. What evidence did you find, Dr. Train? None whatsoever. I even moved our wardrobe trunks. What was that crash we heard? Uh, one of the trunks. It got away from me as I tipped it. Dr. Tree, there's something that's bothering me considerably. Yes, Mr. Gray? Your emotions... He seemed to be holding him singularly in check for a man who's just seen his bride lying in front of him, dead. Thank you, Mr. Drake. I have learned a great deal from the Rajah. Yes. Sublimity of the mind. Well, Inspector, as long as we've come this far, we might as well go down and take a look for ourselves. But I assure you, there's nothing to be found. Come on. This is it, gentlemen. We are now directly beneath the stage. I see. Are these the uh, wardrobe trunks you were moving, Doctor? Yes. 
What's this little tin pail? One of the props, I believe, eh, Mildred? Yeah, the Roger makes roses grow out of them. This one's been smashed. <laughs> I'm afraid the trunk fell on it. I see that some of your sand has leaked through onto the floor from above. Possibly. There are several holes in the stage. Hey, Mike, come over here. Yes, Inspector? Here's where the murder was committed. Yeah? Oh. See one of these holes here in the ceiling? See, this one has powder marks. Somebody poked a gun through this hole and pulled the trigger. Mm, I wonder who. Mildred, that's who. She's the only one who was off stage, and I took a gun away from her, remember? But Mildred's gun was an automatic. An automatic wouldn't fit into that hole, Inspector. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it wasn't Mildred, but somebody did. How about I find the gun, too, right here in this basin? Mr. Drake, can I speak to you alone? Well, I... Go ahead, go ahead, Bart. I'll speak with the doctor here. I'm going to find that gun, and I'm betting he'll help me find it. Bart. Mind if I call you Bart? Why not? Bart, do you believe love is overpowering? Are you trying to tell me that this is a crime of passion? How has me love is everything? It has its points. But what do you want to talk to me about? Well, you're more the romantic type than the inspector. Nice. I could go for a guy like you. It's pretty easy to go for yourself. I'm an awful jam, Bart. Really? Bart, kiss me. Oh, no. I never refuse a lady in distress. We'll have fun. That depends whether the sheriff will let you out. Oh, now, Bart, don't spoil it. Open your heart, darling. What crooks? Dr. Tree never would have married Loretta if he'd been here teaching the school. He was out of his environment. Uh-huh. Something like I was a few minutes ago? Oh, now, baby. Be nice. Sorry. After the ceremony, he found out his mistake, but it was too late. She wouldn't give him up. After all, managing the Rogers, a $100,000 racket she wanted her part of the take. You admit it's a racket, huh? Only you. I can trust you, Bart, can I? Well, it's uncertain limitation. What's the rest? Well, I... Uh, I saw Dr. Tree with sympathy. So I gave it to him. In other words, you need a play. Well, and when you play, you play hard. That isn't very nice, Bart. Let me say it for you. The letter became jealous of you. She became so jealous that the doctor felt he had to kill her. You know better than that. Dr. Tree was on stage all evening. That's so. Then the letter became so jealous that you had to kill her. You weren't on stage all evening. That's the kind of conclusion I thought the inspector made. That's why I wanted to talk to you. It's a very simple matter to find out if you fired the gun. Those stones leave powder marks embedded in the skin of your hand. I did fire a gun. Out there on stage, remember? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if that's all you have to tell me, we're wasting time, my sweetheart. I uh, haven't mentioned the most important thing. You mean that more? I have... I was dead once. I wrote a guy for his dough. The letter was with me. She held it over my head. Said if I didn't leave her husband alone, she'd go to the police about me. And while she was there, she'd expose the Raj as a fake. When she turned to leave me, the Raj was standing there. He heard everything she said. So, you think the Raj killed the letter, huh? Well, I didn't actually see him do it, but he had a darn good motive. But Dr. Tree made a great point of the fact that the Raj couldn't have killed her. Remember, the Raj, too, was on stage all evening. I thought... Dr. Dree said that? Yes. Yeah. That the Roger couldn't have killed Loretta. What? Well, I thought... I thought that he... Yes? What did you think? Yes, Mildred. Tell us, what do you think? Yes, my dear. Tell us, what do you think? Well, Mildred? Roger, I... I didn't know you were there. Your I... words accuse me of murder. Well, I didn't mean to accuse you. I simply meant you could have killed her. Is true. It would have been possible. I know something of firearms. Even better still, I know ways of controlling the human mind so that a person will destroy himself. I would have a care, Mildred. I know, Raja, I know. But I did not kill Loretta. Did you know that Loretta had threatened to expose your claims to abnormal mental power as false, Raja? I did. It was as though a great tree had fallen across my body, crushing out my spirit. How was I to know that these three had contrived to embellish my miracles 
with the use of mechanical contrivances, fraud and trickery. Since I learned this through Miss Loretta's thoughtless words, my life has become a mockery. I am nothing but a bit of chaff being ground in the middle of commercialism. Mm. You must sort of grace hatred of them, rise up, he drum me. And especially for Loretta, who threatened to expose you. Hatred is not within the concepts of my mind, Mr. Drake. It is an unworthy emotion. I can sympathize with you. Then you say, hmm? when this crime becomes public knowledge, my work as a charlatan for this past year will also become public. Will it not? I'm afraid so, Oh, God! Oh, oh! Good heavens, that's the inspector. Oh, God! Where are you, inspector? In here! In the mummy cave! Stand where you are, Mr. Drake. Doctor Tree, he has a gun! Yes, and I'll use it. Unless you let Mildred and me go free. What about the riser? Don't you want him to go free, too? No. I'm certain that he killed my wife, Loretta. Oh, pull me out! What makes you so sure, Dr. Tring? Because the inspector found the murder weapon, this gun, in the Rajah's trunk. I'm sure that the inspector must be mistaken. Hey, Paul, you don't let me out. I'm sure he's not mistaken. This is the gun. I've seen it before. But how could it be the murder weapon when I have the murder weapon right here? Oh, no! Uh, you, you shot it out of my hand! Now, will you please release the inspector from the mummy case? I shall be happy to do so. Where is he? I'll send him up for life, interfering with an officer in the line of duty. Now, don't feel too bad, Inspector. I've heard of Egyptians who stayed in those things for thousands of years. The dirty, luggy tripped me. Pretended he was trying to help us. I dropped the gun and he shoved me inside that thing and slammed it shut. Oh, Bart, when the boys hear about this... No, no, don't worry, Inspector. I won't tell. I think I'll just work the doctor over for a last minute, Inspector. Let's get one crime solved before we come involved in another. Uh, and the way I see it, Dr. Tree here and the beautiful Mildred are in love, age notwithstanding. Each seems to be afraid that the other did the killing, and uh, each is trying to protect the other. I can get results quicker with the heel of my hand. I'll make the doctor confess, but quick. I'll save you the trouble, Inspector. If you all come out onto the stage, I believe I can now reconstruct the crime. <laughs> If you will be so kind, Mr. Drake, I would like to go to my dressing room and lie down. I'm overcome with shit. Oh, no, you don't. You'll stay here. I'd uh, prefer it, Raza. Uh, as you wish. Although my shame is punishment almost too great to bear. If I committed a crime, it was in all innocence. I was gullible. These are the tricksters who brought me in my work. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we'll take care of that in a minute, Raja. First, I want you to notice these three holes here on the floor. One was for the tube that Loretta breathed through. One was used to push the barrel of the revolver upwards. It's just tight enough to hold it firmly. But there's still another hole. Yes. What was that for? The little tin pail, Inspector, that we found downstairs. It was tied to the trigger of the gun directly under this third hole. So when the sand was shoveled in over the girl, some of it ran through the hole and into the pail. When the bucket gained sufficient weight, naturally, it pulled the trigger of the gun. Well, I'll be there. What a nice thing it <laughs> You will when you tell it to the boys. Incredible. What I want to know is why we didn't hear the gun go off. Oh, Inspector, how could you? The gun was under the stage. It was also covered by Loretta's body and over two feet of sand. A perfect setup. Even the murderer couldn't be exactly sure when it was going to go off. Yeah, but why wouldn't it still be sticking there in the hole? The murderer poked it out himself after the sand had been removed, Inspector. But it would have been on the floor downstairs. Any one of the three could have retrieved it from there, Inspector. Mildred wasn't on the stage all the time. The Raja went down to rest, and Dr. Tree went to looking for evidence. Yeah. I think we'd better run all three of them. Oh, I'd love to run you. Hey, no, you don't. No, you don't. Give me that knife. <laughs> I'm afraid you're too late, Inspector. I go where spirits are kind. Where there is no fraud or deception. Father. Father. Yes, my son. You're dying. You know that, don't you? Yes. Please. Is as I wish it. 
What about the murder, Raja? Tell us. Uh, a human can only stand so much sight. I worked for great news, then found that true great news was not for me. That is a tragedy unto itself. Tell us. Please tell us about the letter. The letter. Ah. Hey, he's dead. Yes, he's dead. Well, I guess that just about closes the case. Yes, Dr. Tree, it just about does. <laughs> You know, Inspector, the Raja was a good and sincere man. He had a lot of talent, if the others hadn't tried to exploit it. What kind of talent? Extrasensory perception, for one thing. It, what's that? <laughs> Skip it. I don't believe it, whatever it is. Now, don't tell me that he gave you some kind of a thought transfer that made you tell me to arrest Dr. Tree for Loretta's murder. Or maybe you read his mind. No, Inspector. It wasn't a thought transfer, in fact, it was Dr. Tree's complete lack of thinking that put me on the right track. Yeah? Yes, I'm afraid so. You remember when he announced Loretta's death from the stage. He yes. said she'd been shot. But when we looked at the body lying face up on that bed of spikes, there was no visible wound. We didn't find the wound until we turned her over. Well, I'd have seen that, too. Only I was out posting guards on the doors and phoning headquarters. Why, of course you would, Inspector. Just as you knew that Dr. Tree was the only person who could possibly have pushed that gun barrel down through the hole in the floor. Did I know that? I certainly did. He was the one who shoveled the sand out of the way. He was the only person who came near the body and the gun. You knew that, Inspector. You wouldn't have insisted on staying downstairs and searching for the murder weapon. I found it, too. Yes, you certainly did, Inspector. In the Rogers trunk, right where Dr. Tree had put it. I'm good, ain't I? Yes, you are. You certainly are. It was you who also pushed the trunk aside, Inspector, the trunk that Dr. Tree used to hide and smash the little tin pail, which was attached to the figure of the revolver. Ha, that was easy. Oh, I don't it know. It was you, though, who found a little pile of sand. Mm hmm You know, Bart, love is a terrible thing. Oh, Inspector, don't tell me that you're down on love. I am when it makes a guy kill his wife because he wanted a babe like Mildred. Ah, uh, Mildred isn't so bad, Inspector. You can blame greed just as much as love. Loretta hung on to the doctor not because she loved him. She only wanted a wife share of his $100,000 racket. Yeah, love and greed. Both of them are terrible. Hmm. Hey, Bart, remember, you promised that you wouldn't tell the boys down at headquarters about me being locked up in that mummy case. Oh, Inspector, of course I won't. I don't get any pleasure out of telling the world that a man is a fake. Mystery is my hobby. Why, hey, cool down, Bart. <laughs> is my hobby. Inspector Dan and I decided to take a few days off and do some fishing. We stopped at a place called Pine Haven Lodge, located in the heavily tempered slopes of the Adirondacks. Judd Loring, owner of the lodge, had told us of a likely pool, which was known only to himself and a few others. Well, I guess this is the place, Inspector. Yeah, I guess it is. Look at that pool. Quiet as a mill pond. You know, it reminds me of the time we were on that windmill case up in your hands. Oh, yes, I remember that. The surface of the water on that pond was as smooth as this one, but... Uh, the sails on the window were turning. Yeah. And we wondered why the pond wasn't ruffled if there was enough wind to make the windmill sails go around. <laughs> Which led us to suspect that some mechanical device was being employed to turn the windmill. Yeah. We found it was a hidden motor that was turning the windmill, and the windmill was pumping oil from a pipeline. Mm -hmm. You certainly were clever to figure that one out, Inspector. I was clever? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I was, wasn't I? You were indeed. <laughs> well, let's hope that no murders occur. Uh, to spoil our fun this time. Yeah. Say, uh, Bart. Yes, Inspector. Did you bring the worms? Worms? Sure. How are we going to fish without worms? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to use a royal coachman, Inspector. Pass me that date box, will you? Date box? Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Yeah. Thanks. What's the Royal Coachman? When I was a kid, we just stuck a worm on a bent hairpin. We didn't need any coachman along. Royal are common. <laughs> a Royal Coachman, Inspector, is a wet fly. Oh? And there we are. Did you ever catch any fish, Inspector? Ever catch any fish? Say, stand what? aside, please, Inspector. I'm going to cast. Okay, okay. <laughs> this uh, fish I caught was bigger than... By Jove, the... Inspector, did you see that rainbow leap? No. Uh, my fish was bigger than... Inspector, Jim Loring was right. This pool is fairly alive with trout. Is it? That fish of mine must... Look out, look out. I've got a strike. I've got a strike. Oh, what? Do you want to hear about my fish, or don't you? Uh, oh, too bad he got away. Oh, well. There seem to be plenty more. Oh, uh, what were you saying, Inspector? Nothing. Oh, calm, calm, Inspector. Tell me about it. Nothing doing. I'm not forcing my fish stories on anyone. Well, very well. Suit yourself. You mean, you're not going to insist that I tell you? Naturally not, if you don't want it. Wait a minute. Inspector, listen. Huh? Listen to what? Someone's coming. Well, what about it? Let them come. We don't own this pool. Maybe they got some worms, huh? Jim Loring said that nobody at the lodge knew about this pool. Keep quiet a minute. Listen. It's perfectly silly you'd make such a flat you in, Fun, are you kidding? Listen to me, Rita. Unless you make up your mind to forget that old buzzard and come away with me, I'm going to kill him. But I mean... Oh, you... Hey, that guy sounds serious. Keep quiet. Wait. We're hidden by that screen of bushes. They can't see us. Keep quiet now. Listen. Oh, you darling, you shouldn't talk like that. You know you shouldn't. Why not? It's the way I feel. You're in love with me and... Wait a Yes, sir. You are in love with me, aren't you? Yes. I am in love with you. Well, then... Oh, but this is not to end you. And? I've made up my mind, darling. We, we can't keep holding these clandestine meetings. It isn't fair, and it makes it harder for both of us. And you think it's going to be easier if we don't see each other, huh? Rita, be reasonable. You know what will happen if we call it quit. I know it'll be best for both of us. It won't. We'll stay apart for just so long, and then we'll be back together again. It's happened before. I know, I know. Rita, listen to me. We were made for each other. No two people were ever more suited, and you know it. Oh, I don't know what to say or do I... I'm so unhappy. Now, don't worry about it, darling. Let me take care of it. There's no use of us ruling our lives. Well, how do you like that? I don't like it, Inspector. And do you know who that was? That was young Hugh Osmond and Rita Conrad. She's the babe who's married to the Oil King, isn't she? Yes, Hugh Conrad. The gossips at the lodge have it that she married him for his money. The gossips must know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. No young girl had tied up to an old buck like that unless he can offer something besides the wisdom of be 75 years. You are becoming lyrical, Inspector. Huh. I wonder just how serious Osmond was when he threatened to solve his and Rita's problem by murdering the old man. Ah, uh -huh. kids are always making big talk like that. It doesn't amount to anything. That was a shot, Inspector. You don't suppose it Forget even... it. Forget it. Probably somebody target practice. Well, maybe you're right. What? I wish you'd go quit going around looking for murders every time we go any place you... <laughs> Inspector, apparently the target practitioner hit the bullseye. Come on, come okay, on. Okay, okay, but I still say we're looking for trouble. A shot from the woman screamed. It's a perfect formula for trouble, Inspector. It came from this direction, I think. Yeah, but we don't find a thing except a dead squirrel or something. Yes, I suppose the woman was screaming for joy because her boyfriend proved himself a great huntsman. Yeah, huh? yeah. Oh, you're certainly quick with comebacks, aren't you? Sometimes I wonder... Look, look Inspector. Hey... The guy lying on the ground and a babe kneeling over him. Yes, and unless I'm greatly mistaken, the guy is Gil Conrad and the woman is Rita, his wife. Let's get over there quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, Gil. Why did you do it? Why? Why? Oh, thank you. Someone here. What happened, Mrs. Conrad? I don't know. I'm not sure. I think that Gil shot himself. Shot himself? Well, maybe you're right. There's a gun in his hand, there's a bullet hole through his head, and there's powder burn. Tell us exactly what happened, Mrs. Conrad. Well, I... I was walking along the riverbank, and I heard a shot. I came over to investigate, and I'm still lying here. See? Everything adds up. It was suicide, all right. Yes, maybe. What makes you think it was suicide, Mrs. Conrad? Because Gil told me. Your husband told you? Yes, he he wasn't dead when I got here. He, he lived long enough to, to tell me that he'd decided to end it all. What could be more perfect? But let's get the car in. Inspector, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh -huh. Where was Hugh Osmond when all this was happening, Mrs. Conrad? Hugh? Why, uh, I... I don't know. Why should I? Because we just overheard a conversation between you and Osmond. We heard Osmond threaten to kill your husband. No, no. No, you didn't do it. You, you mustn't think that he did. No? Gil shot himself. He, he Rita, told me he did. Rita, what happened? Hugh. What could happen to Gil? Yes, it's Gil, all right, Osmond. What do you know about it? What do I know about it? 
Why should I know anything about it? Oh, lots of reasons, bub. You've been bragging about how you're going to knock the guy off, haven't you? What the devil are you talking about? Of course I have. Oh, no, Hugh. No, no, no. Don't deny it. They heard us talking. Hey, what? I'm sorry, Osmond. We were fishing in the deep pool, and we heard your conversation with Mrs. Conrad a few minutes ago. Well, what about it? Doesn't mean that I shot Conrad. I'd be a fool to think I could get away with anything like that. That's the most sensible thing you've said, Bob. What I want to know is, why weren't you two together when you heard the shot? Oh, what's the use? If you overheard our conversation, then you know why. We didn't want to be seen returning to the lodge together. Don't answer any more of their questions, Rita. We don't have to, without a lawyer. You've already told them that Gil admitted suicide. If that isn't enough, How do you know that, Osmond? How do I know what? That Mrs. Conrad told us that her husband had admitted taking his own life. Well, didn't she? Yeah, but you weren't here, bub. Why, I... I... Yeah, I, I. You two kind of got your wires crossed, haven't you? No, we haven't. What are you two trying to do? Trick us into admitting we're responsible for Conrad's death? Could be. The thing is, though, if we put the finger on you, we'll do it without tricks. But I take it all back. There's dirty work afoot. I quite agree with you, Inspector. Sorry, Osmond. You get your lawyer, we'll get the coroner. Then we'll take on from there, eh? Hello, Bart. Come on in. Thanks. Has the coroner gone yet? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice guy. You left the whole deal in my lap. <laughs> Where have you been? I've been having some further conversation with Hugh Osmond. I'm afraid he succeeded in selling me a bill of goods. What kind of goods? Osmond claims that uh, when he heard the shot, he came running back. Just before he reached the clearing where Conrad lay, he heard Rita scream. So then, what did he do? He stopped behind some bushes and listened. He overheard Conrad tell his wife that he had shot himself. So that's how he knew Conrad had admitted suicide. Mm, apparently, yes. Do you believe him? I believe part of what he said. He showed me the spot where he'd been standing. It was close enough to the clearing so that his story could be true. Well, why did he keep hiding them after we arrived? Well, according to him, to see which way the wind blew. I was, uh, it was only when uh, he believed that we were going to accuse Rita of murder that he decided to show himself. And that's the part of his story you don't believe in? No, Inspector. I'm not sure yet. By the way, Inspector, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been getting along. Come over here. Well, discover something, huh? I modestly admit that I've discovered quite something. Well. Yeah. That's Conrad's body lying there on the couch, isn't it? It certainly is, Inspector. Note the bullet hole through his head. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's a clean hole all the way through. Yeah. Now, there are powder burns on the right side of his head, aren't there? That's correct, Inspector. Sure. And since we found Conrad holding the gun in his right hand, the setup would indicate that the guy is right-handed, wouldn't it? Quite true, Inspector. Well, the guy is left-handed. What? Now, why, when he decided to shoot himself, would he do it with his right hand? A good question, Inspector. How do you know that Conrad was left-handed? That's my discovery. Look, I've been fishing through his pockets. I found his keys and his loose change in his left-hand pants pocket. Right, Joe, Inspector. Yeah. A guy who carries his dough and his keys in his left-hand pants pocket only does so because he's left-handed. Mm-hmm. So the way I figure it is, Mr. Gil Conrad was murdered and someone tried to make it look like suicide. Amazing. Do you mind if I look through his pockets too, Inspector? Go ahead. Who cares? If you don't want to take my word for oh, it. Oh, come, come, come. You know your word is as good as gold, as far as I'm concerned. As far as you're concerned. So everyone else thinks I'm a liar. Well, now who's that? Why don't you open the door and see? Possibly the murderer has come to confess his crime. Very funny. Huh. It's a babe. You, uh, looking for someone, miss? Uh, yes. I'm looking for Inspector Danton. Are you Inspector Danton? Yep, I'm Danton. Come on in. I'm Laura Bailey. Mrs. Conrad's my sister. I I just heard about the terrible thing that happened to Gil. Oh, you did? You know anything about it, do you? I think I might be able to tell you something that will help explain why Gil took his own life. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were alone, Inspector Dad. No. That guy standing up over there is Barton Drake. The uh, horizontal gent is your brother-in-law. Barton Drake? Oh, I'm so glad you happened to be here, Mr. Drake. I, I've heard so much of you. My name is Laura Bailey. Sure, I Everybody's heard of Drake. How do you do, Miss Bailey? Did I hear you say you're Mrs. Conrad's sister? Yes. We were all staying here at the lodge together. Oh, I would have come sooner, only I couldn't believe that Gil was serious when I talked to him this morning. When you took... When was that, Miss Bailey? Shortly after breakfast. 
He asked me to come to his cabin. Now, don't tell us that he threatened to commit suicide. That's exactly what he did, Inspector Denton. You see, Gil had found out about Rita and Hugh. I see. And why should he talk it over with you, Miss Bailey? He felt that he had to talk to someone. He knew that I was his friend. I couldn't believe that Rita was being untrue. He asked me what I knew about it. And what did you tell him, lady? I told him that Rita was in love with Hugh Osmond. Why should I deny it? Rita is young and beautiful. Why should she waste her life on an old man? The thing is that Rita should have thought of that when she married the old man. These women who take a guy for his dough and then try to walk out on the deal get in my hair. It wasn't Rita's fault. Gil begged her to marry him. But she hadn't met you then. Oh, nuts. So Conrad told you he was going out and commit suicide. Is that right, Miss Burley? Yes. I didn't believe him, of course. He wanted me to talk to Rita, persuade her to forget you. When I refused, he tried to work on my sympathy by threatening suicide. That is probably because he figured you were his best friend. Now, look, lady, we have to know that... Inspector, huh? Miss Bailey, was your brother-in-law right-handed or left-handed? <laughs> what a strange question. Why, he was right-handed. Uh-huh. You are sure of that, Miss Bailey? Of course I'm sure. I've known Gil for years. I'd most certainly have noticed any strange traits of character that he had. Now, just a minute. Just one minute. Lady... I'm too polite to call a female a liar, but I just got through proving Careful, that... Inspector. Careful now. Huh? There's no doubt in my mind that Miss Bailey's telling the truth. Well, uh, what was that, Bart? Of course I'm telling the truth. Gil was as right-handed as I am. Everybody knows that. That's just the point, Inspector. Everybody probably does know it. It's a fact that can be easily checked. Because of that, I hardly think Miss Bailey would run the risk of lying. But doggone it, Bart. That means the guy probably did commit suicide. And you said yourself he was murdered. Murdered? Yeah. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course Gil took his own life. On the contrary, Miss Bailey, your brother-in-law was very definitely murdered. Furthermore, it was either you or your sister or Hugh Osman who murdered him. The two of you who are innocent of the crime know which one is guilty and are trying to shield him or her. I hope you realize that that makes you all equally guilty in the eyes of the law. Oh, Laura. Come in, dear. Did you see Inspector Danton? Yes, I saw him. Did you tell him that Gil had told you he was going to commit suicide? Yes. Hugh, how did Gil know that you and Rita were in love? The last I knew, you were taking every precaution to keep that knowledge from him. I told him myself. Hugh! Sorry, darling. I should have told you. I, I couldn't see the point in keeping him in the dark any longer. I went to him this morning and asked him to give you up. Oh, darling, you shouldn't have. And, of course, Gil refused. Not only refused, he wouldn't believe me. I guess that's why he sent for you, Laura. Undoubtedly. And you knew nothing of this, Rita? Oh, no. Gil acted strangely this morning, but I didn't guess what was behind it. Oh, you, why didn't you tell me? Well, why should I? It would only have made you more unhappy. I hope that I could make you see things my way. Oh, I wish I had. I wish I'd seen things your way a long time ago. Perhaps this never would have happened then. Darling, everything's going to be all right. I'm afraid everything isn't going to be all right, Hugh. What do you mean? Barton Drake is convinced that Gil was murdered. He says that he can prove it. Oh, that's nonsense. I hope you're right, Hugh. Mr. Drake says that one of us murdered Gil. He says the two who are innocent are trying to shield the guilty one. He says that he has the proof, Laura? Yes. I don't believe it. If he knows that Gil was murdered and that one of us is guilty, why hasn't he made an arrest? Because he isn't sure yet which one of us three committed the murder. Laura, you sound as though you believe one of us is guilty. I do. Laura. Well, don't look at me, Laura. I didn't do it. Oh, Laura, you don't think that I had... Sir, where were you, Laura, when Gil was being murdered? You see... None of us actually trust the other, do we? Well, what are we going to do about it? Is the guilty party going to confess to save the other two? Oh, you don't know what you're saying. Of course we're not going to confess. I mean, you... you didn't. Of course I didn't. It certainly wasn't I. Laura, control yourself, darling. I'm not going to confess either. I didn't murder Gil, but I know who did. <laughs> Step 
so uh, we're working out uh, another of your little deals, eh, boss? That's right, Inspector. And uh, we had to wait until night to do it. Eh? Right again, Inspector. Why? Why what? Why did we have to wait until it got dark? Why don't you tell me what we're up to? Doggone it, Bart. Be quiet, Inspector. Huh? Wait a minute. What's the matter? Let's wait here and see what happens. Yeah. Why not? That sounds like fun. For crying out loud, what do you think is going to happen? We'll know in a minute, Inspector, if I've guessed correctly. You see that group of three cabins over there, the ones with the lighted windows and drawn curtains? Sure, I see them. That big one is where Gil Conrad and his wife live. That's right. And the one in the middle is occupied by Laura, Rita's sister. The one next to that is occupied by Hugh Osmond and the... Oh, oh. What's the uh oh for? Someone just walked past the window in Laura's cabin. What about it? Maybe the babe can't sleep. Maybe she's walking back and forth to wear herself out. Maybe, but the trouble is, we're not sure that it was Laura, are we, Inspector? All we can see is the silhouette behind that curtain. Oh, look, Bart. <laughs> I love mysteries, but when you pull them out of thin air. Look, look Inspector. There goes someone pacing behind the curtain in Osmond's cabin. Yeah. Now, don't tell me that wasn't a man. No, you have good eyesight, Inspector. Sure. Have you your gun handy? Why, sure, I got it handy. Right here in my hand. Man, you may need it. <clears throat> Look, there goes someone past the curtain in Rita's cabin. So that makes all three of them pacing the floor. Right. Now are you happy? Perfectly, Inspector. I couldn't have hoped for better results. Keep your eye on them, Inspector. Okay. How long do we keep this up? I'm getting cold. There, there. Osmond passed the window and didn't return. Neither did Rita. So what? Only Laura seems to be active. I wonder now how long. <laughs> That's it, Inspector. Come on. Someone shot at the girl in Laura's cabin. And hit her, too, I think. Over this way, Inspector. The shot came from behind that cabin. Yeah, there he goes. Let him have it, Inspector. Yeah. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Get down, Inspector. He's going to be stubborn. Who can play at that game? You missed him, Inspector. He's heading for the woods. I never missed that guy's hitting. I joke, you're right. Look, he's stumbling. He's more than stumbling. He's flat on his face. Come on. Here he is. Look out, look out. He's still holding his yeah, gun. Yeah, but he's in no condition to use it. I'll just roll him over. Come. And Judas, it's Osmond. Of course it's Osmond, Inspector. Let's hope he'll live long enough to confess to the shooting of Gil Conrad. Otherwise, I think we're going to have a time proving him guilty. <laughs> It's Mr. Drake. Yes, yes, it is. Is your sister seriously hurt, Mrs. Conrad? No, no, the bullet just grazed her neck. Oh, I'm glad. I sent for a doctor. He should be here any minute. Doctor won't be necessary. I've taken care of Laura. Oh, you have? Mr. Drake. Yes? It, it was you, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry, Mrs. Conrad. You must have loved you very much. Dead? Well, I... Oh, Inspector. Is he dead? Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> Lived long enough to tell us it was him who shot your husband, lady. You know, that's something I can't figure out. He didn't have to confess. Why did he? Well, the answer to that's pretty obvious, Inspector. You knew he was going to die. He didn't want anyone else to be blamed for a crime he had committed. Oh, yeah, you. yeah I, I guess that must be it. Even when he passed out, he didn't know we had him paid for the crime. Yes, Inspector. That royal coachman of yours doesn't seem to be doing much good. Ah, patience, Inspector. Patience is the virtue of all fishermen. Patience and uh, silence. I see what you mean. Thank you. Wish we'd brought along a set of chessmen. 
I even wish there was a good-looking babe around so he wouldn't have to just sit here and stare at the water. <laughs> okay, Inspector, let's talk about it. Yeah, let's. Right. Now, look, this is the way I got it figured. Hmm? You told Laura that you knew one of the three was guilty, so she'd tell the other. That's right, Inspector. I also told her that I believed that the two innocent people were trying to shield the guilty one. So Osmond, being the guilty one, had to dispose of Laura because he thought she knew he was guilty. That's right. He also knew that uh, if she continued to shield him and was found out, she was going to be held as an accomplice. He knew that Rita would never give him away because Rita was in love with him. Right you are, Inspector. You know, Laura actually hadn't much to gain. He was afraid she'd break down, which she probably would have, too. Now... Uh, there's two other things. Two, Inspector? What? Yeah. Uh, how did you know that Conrad hadn't committed suicide? Well, that one's easy, Inspector. You see, Conrad was shot through the head. That means he was killed instantly, doesn't it? Well, so what? So? Rita told us that when she reached him, he lived long enough to confess to his own suicide, remember? Well, I'm a royal coachman's coach dog. You see, Rita either saw Osmond shoot Conrad or suspected that he had. So, naturally, she wanted to protect him. That's why she told us the story of Conrad's confession. And that's how you knew that Rita would never give Osmond away. Yes, that's it. Now, uh, what was the other thing you wanted to know, Inspector? Oh, yes, yeah. Now, uh, look, Bart, I proved by a bit of ingenious deduction that Conrad was left-handed, and then you come along and call me a liar. Oh, no, no. You Never did. Thought, Inspector. You did. Never would I call you a liar. Never. Well, it amounted to that. No. I don't like it. You got to back up that crack you made with some proof of your own. All right, Inspector, I'll do my best. You believe that Conrad was left-handed because uh, he carried his money and keys in the left-hand pocket of his trousers, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, with a clever piece of work on your part, Inspector, the trouble is, you didn't go far enough. What do you mean I didn't go far enough? You didn't look in his other pockets. You see, in the right-hand pocket of Conrad's trousers, there was a hole. Oh, oh, my job, Inspector. Look out, I've got a strike. All right, all right. So he carried his stuff in his left-hand pocket because he had a hole in his right-hand pocket. All right, all and right. The side, Inspector. Oh, boy, what a beauty. Look out, Inspector. He's heading for that log. Who cares? Doggone it. Oh, the devil. He got away. Oh, Inspector, I give up. I thought it might be fishing. But what might be fishing? My hobby, Inspector. I'm afraid I'll have to continue to admit that... Mystery is my hobby. Mystery is my hobby. Today's story began in New York shortly after Christmas. I'd received a phone call from an Ambrose Carlton, and I'd asked him to come to my apartment for a consultation. Yes, you are Barton Drake? Yes, and you're Ambrose Carlton. Will you come in, please? Thank you. Oh, you have company. Mr. Drake, I ask especially... Yes, I know. You asked especially to see me alone. However, since if I decide to take your case, Inspector Danton would work with me... I thought it would save time and bother if I asked him to come to my apartment to listen to your story. This, then, is Inspector Noah Danton, your co-worker. That's right. How are you, Mr. Carlton? Good evening, Inspector. Well, Mr. Drake, have you given any thought to my proposition? I have, and I'm in favor of it. Splendid. And you, Mr. Drake? Well, I share the inspector's enthusiasm for a trip south, and yet... Yet you doubt the credulity of my story? No, not at all. I don't for the moment question the value of your original paintings. Now, the fact that someone's trying to steal them. Oh, but why not forget for once that murder's your hobby? Let's go down to Florida and sit in the sun and watch the bathing beauties bathe. <laughs> Florida bathing beauties, Inspector. Never bathe. Never bathe? Now, wait a minute, I but... mean, of course, in the ocean, Inspector. Oh. Mr. Drake, the man who is attempting to steal my paintings is Brian Quirk. Mm hmm? You're sure of that? Brian Quirk? Hey, that is something. He's the most famous international crook out of captivity. You're quite right, Inspector Danton. He was stop at nothing to obtain possession of my Rembrandt. Now, what makes you so positive, Mr. Carlton, that it's Quirk who's attempting to steal your paintings? Quirk himself has told me so. Quirk told you so? Yes. On several occasions, Brian Quirk has called me on the phone and stated flatly that he intends to possess my paintings. Oh, Quirk is noted for that sort of thing. He's a shrewd operator. Three days ago, Mr. Drake, one of my servants was murdered. Murdered? Well, now you're talking our language. Shall I make our reservations by... Just a minute, Inspector. Huh? Have you reported this murder to the police, Mr. Carlton? Of course. 
They investigated and learned nothing except that Leopold was shot by a man who was attempting to steal the paintings. How do you know that? Leopold was not killed instantly. He lived long enough to explain that he had been attacked while on guard in the very room where the pictures are kept. I see. And the police have been unable to uncover any clues that might lead to the identity of the murderer? The identity of the murderer is already known, Mr. Drake. Ryan Quirk left his calling card. A note pinned to the floor with a dagger. Say, I saw that gag work in the movies once. It was called The Clutching Hand or The Hooded Terror or something like that. I assure you, this is no movie, Inspector Denton. Oh. So the police have abandoned any further attempts to run down Brian Quirk. Is that right, Mr. Felton? Well, I can't blame them. They did what they could. Obviously, this man Quirk is shrewd beyond human conception. No man is that shrewd, Mr. Carton. All criminals are possessed with at least one weakness. I imagine that weakness with Brian Quirk is his vanity. Eventually, it'll lead to his downfall. Well, I hope you're right. Frankly, Quirk's attitude is something of a challenge. I dislike to think that he can outsmart me. Yes, but on the other hand, you have your other servants to consider. If more murders result from Quirk's attempt to steal your paintings, you will feel personally responsible. Mr. Drake, it will be worth $10,000 to me if you'll come to Florida and take over my case. Ten grand, that's a lot of dough, Bart. Yes, it is, Inspector. If at the end of a week's time you feel that apprehending Brian Quirk is beyond your ability... I will pay you the 10000 and you may return to New York. Hey, that's fair enough, Bart. And what of your paintings, Mr. Carlton? Well, I suppose I shall have to dispose of them. I can't continue to be responsible for the lives of the people in my employ. Splendid. Inspector, make reservations on the first available plane to Miami. Hey, Bart, for God's sake, can't you drive easier? Sorry, Inspector. These swamp roads here in the Everglades weren't built for automobile travel. Well, what were they built for? And what does Carlton have to live way out here in the jungle for anyway? And why didn't he meet us at the airport? <laughs> Inspector, I think you're annoyed because you didn't get a chance to watch the bathing beauties. I'm not annoyed. I'm doggone sore about it. <laughs> hey, Inspector, you're magnificent. Yeah? Well, why didn't Carlton tell us he lived way to heck and gone out of here instead of in a nice, cool, stucco bungalow on Miami Beach like any sensible man would? I suspect that Mr. Carlton didn't want to discourage us, Inspector. Discourage us? I've been discouraged ever since we stepped off that plane. I guess this is it. Well, for crying out loud, look at that wall with a barbed wire on top. Yes, and Mr. Carlton said he had his home protected against thieves. I guess this was what he meant. There's the house beyond the wall. Yeah. You can barely make it out in this dim light. Listen. What's that? It's the voice of the swamp inspector. Come on, let's go up and announce ourselves before it gets completely dark. I don't know why Carlton couldn't have left that iron gate open so we could drive up to the house. I imagine Brian Quirk was disappointed also, inspector. The gate seems to be locked. Yeah, there's a rope hanging through the slot. Shall I give it a yank? Yes, it's probably a latch string. Here goes. The jumping Judas, what's that? It sounds like an alarm bell. Here comes someone. Yeah, he came out of that little house. Hey, he's got a gun. He's probably one of Mr. Carlton's guards. He's a regular giant, isn't he? Hello there. The alarm bell she rings and Carlo comes quick. Yeah, well, shut it off. It's getting on my nerves. Si, senor. You are senors Drake and Danton, si? That's right. We're Drake and Danton. Mr. Carlton's expecting us. Si, I will open the gate. Thank you. Be careful, senors. There are many traps about. Traps? What does Carlton take us for? A couple of wolves? The wolves are all over on Miami Beach, Inspector. Very funny. Uh, uh, you will follow me, senors, please. Hey, Bart. I don't like this. What don't you like about it, Inspector? It's spooky. Oh? Look at the way those vines are crawling over the house. And listen to those noises. They're not real. <laughs> come, come, Inspector. Let's not allow our imagination to run away with us. Hey, listen. Yes, I hear it. Now, don't tell me that's my imagination. That's organ music. It certainly is, Inspector. You will follow me, please. Come on, Inspector. Hey, there's someone coming from the house. Yes. Oh, it's Mr. Carlton. Are you disappointed because it isn't a spook, Inspector? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hurricane Manor. I must express my regret at not being able to meet your plane. You're not half as regretful as we are. Look, Mr. Carlton, why didn't you tell us you lived way out here in the swamp? For the very reason that that unhappy expression is on your face, Inspector Danton. Unhappy? Me? <laughs> You're disappointed in my home. 
If I'd explained where I'd lived, you might have refused to accept my proposition. The inspector's only disappointed, Mr. Carlton, because he was unable to see the bathing beauties of Miami Beach. Well, that will come later. Very well, Carlos. Return to your post. Si, senor. I'm glad to get rid of that guy. He looks like a zombie. Carlos is my most reliable servant. Come along, gentlemen. Dinner is waiting. And then I want you to see my paintings. I got to admit that your cook knows how to put together a meal, Mr. Carlton. Thank you, Inspector. Jose will be pleased. Are there any questions you'd like to ask before we look at the paintings, Mr. Drake? Yes, several. Just as a matter of curiosity, we heard organ music as we came up the wall. <laughs> that was Laura. She's my secretary. Oh, uh-huh. she plays beautifully, doesn't she? Yeah, but sad. What's the matter? Is she unhappy about something? I'm afraid that the atmosphere of Hurricane Manor creates a sad mood, Inspector. That I can understand. Laura is very young and beautiful. She doesn't like it here, and I can't blame her. Then why does she remain? The answer to that is simple. I need a secretary. Laura needs money. And I can afford to pay her a large salary. I see. I suppose that living in this remote section of the Everglades is part of your plan to frustrate Brian Quirk's attempt to steal your paintings. That's exactly right, Mr. Drake. Frustrating Brian Quirk has become an obsession with me. I will stop at nothing to capture the man. And Quirk will stop at nothing to obtain possession of your painting. Correct. It's become a sort of game with us. I see. That's why you brought the paintings to this old house and challenged Brian Quirk to steal them. Yes, and he will accept the challenge, too. This is to be the showdown between Brian Quirk and myself. Come along. I want you to see my paintings. Mr. Carson, how many more of these halls have we got to walk down? I'm getting tired. <laughs> it's like that, and you flatter me. Flatter you? What do you mean? I only asked a simple question. Yeah, but a very pointed question. Would you believe that this is the third time we walked down the same hall within the past five minutes? Are you kidding? Oh, not at all. Rooms and corridors are so arranged that a stranger can easily become lost. Walking you down this same hall three times was the test. I suppose that's all part of your plan to confound Brian Quirk. Is that right, Mr. Carlton? Exactly. And here's another. What? A door? What's confounding about that? I'll show you. Open the door, Inspector. Huh? Open. Okay. <laughs> Jumping, Judy. <laughs> you see? <laughs> well, that's very ingenious. I suppose all of the doors in the house are equally well equipped with burglar alarms. Not only the doors, Mr. Drake, but the wire atop the wall that surrounds the place. And all of the windows. And uh, with that kind of a setup, what are you scared of? Brown Quirk succeeded in getting over the wall once, Inspector Danton. Mm. He murdered one of my servants. It was only because he touched off one of the alarms at the downstairs window that he failed to get inside the house. Yeah, but... Uh... The alarms on the windows that ring bells all over the house and in the guardhouses. They also switch on automatic floodlights. And still Quirk got away. The man is a genius. There's one thing that puzzles me, Mr. Carlton. If all the doors in the house are equipped with alarms... Why is it that they don't ring when you or someone else opens them? Because of this. You see, it is possible to open the doors without catching off the alarm. But, uh, your servants? I alone know the combination. Whenever I wish the servants to move about the house, I temporarily disconnect the system. Except for the one in this room. Oh, then it's here where your paintings are kept. Yes. Step this way, please. Thank you. I'll turn on the lights. There they are, hanging on the wall. I do. They are beautiful. Not bad at that. Say, the guy who painted those things must be a comer, all right. Rembrandt was the greatest master of them all, Inspector. You're fortunate to have such valuable possessions, Mr. Carlton. Well, I hope that the time will come when I can feel fortunate, Mr. Drake. Since I bought them a year ago, they've brought me nothing but grief. I see what you mean. By the way, did you install the indirect lighting system that brings up the rich color tones? Yes. You see, the wall paneling being dark mm. is necessary. <laughs> hey, what's that? It sounded like a scream. There it goes again. Good heavens, it must be Laura. She... Good Lord, gentlemen. Ron Quirk has arrived. This way. Screen team from the organ room. Better get off the gun, Inspector. Don't worry, I got it out. Here we are. Jump and shoot us. There's a girl lying on the floor. It's Laura. 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 I don't think she's hurt, Mr. Carlton. Probably fainted. Yeah. She's breathing all right. 
Whoever fired that shot must have missed. Lift up our head, Inspector. Oh, okay. Mr. Carlton, I think you'd better get back to your paintings of Brian Perkins. Oh, George, you're right. What am I thinking of? Take care of Laura. Can I those guns down the line, Bell? Careful, Inspector. Here, you'd better carry the girl over to this couch. Yeah, good idea. I wonder what scared her. Never mind that now. Put her down easily. I am putting her down easily. Well, thank gosh those fellows are stopped. The girl's eyes are opening, Inspector. Yeah. Hey, she is good looking, isn't she? She's beautiful. Feeling better, Laura? You are Laura, aren't you? Oh. Where am I? What happened? You're safe now. Uh, uh, you better not try to get up just yet. Uh, just lie back and take it easy, lady. Who are you? What are you doing here? Keep away from now, me. Just a minute. Don't touch me. Let me go. Don't try to get up, Laura. You're still weak. Let me up. Keep your hands off me. Oh, I hate you. I hate you all. Okay, so you hate us. Now, look. Look out, Inspector. She has a gun. Yeah. Yes, I have. And I know how to use it, too. Now stand back, both of you. Okay, okay. We're not arguing. Don't move. I'll shoot if you do. I promise you I will. Never mind promising, lady. We'll take your word for it. Well, Inspector, she's gone. Yeah, shall we go after her? I don't think it would help much, even if we caught her. No? If we found that one bullet had been fired from that gun she was holding, it would. Why? Why? Well, for guy's sake, we'd know it was her who fired the shot, wouldn't we? And how would that help us? Well, we could ask her questions. Maybe she saw somebody. Maybe firing the shot was a gag. I doubt if it were a gag, Inspector. Obviously, the girl had fainted, and just as obviously, she was frightened of us. I'll say she was. I wonder why. I think I know the answer to that one, Inspector. Come on, let's look around this room a bit. You know the answer to that one. And what the heck do you mean? Here's the organ. Hmm. It's a beauty, isn't it? Now, wait a minute, Bart. I asked you a question. These windows are all equipped with the burglar alarm system. The wiring is plainly visible up there. Okay, the heck with the alarm system. What do you mean you can answer that one? The windows are all bolted on the inside, Inspector. How do you suppose the person who frightened Laura got into the room? Doggone it, Bart, now I... Or perhaps it wasn't a person. What do you think, Inspector? But for the last time... What'd you say, Bart? I said perhaps it wasn't a person who frightened Laura. Huh? What, what do you mean, not a person? Oh, what else? Spooks, Inspector. Oh. Remember, you were worried about spooks a little while ago. Mr. Drake! Inspector Dan, my paintings, they're gone! Someone has stolen my paintings! <laughs> You must see for yourself. I can't believe my eyes. It, it's incredible. It simply cannot be. There. Look. I know. They're gone, all right. Yep, they're gone. The walls as bare as Mother Hubbard's cupboard. How could it have happened? How could it? Every door and window was protected with alarms. There were guards everywhere. When could it have happened? I'm afraid the answer to that question is obvious, Mr. Thousand. It happened when we ran down the hall to investigate the shot and scream. Say, that means that the babe must have been in on the deal. No wonder she acted so screwy. That reasoning is ridiculous, Inspector Danton. Laura's character is absolutely impeccable. I had her investigated. And what about your uh, other servants, Mr. Thousand? They're all beyond reproach. Besides, there is one thing that both of you have overlooked in your reasoning. Yes, what's that? It would be foolish of any of the servants to steal the paintings. They're too rare, too valuable. If offered for sale, they would be spotted immediately. Wouldn't the same theory hold to us, Brian Quirk? No. Quirk is a man of culture and taste. He wants the paintings for their own pleasure, not for their monetary value. I see. Well, Mr. Carlton, I don't think you'll have to worry about the loss of your paintings. Not worry about them? What the deuce are you saying, man? Just this. Quirk apparently got into your house, but not without setting off the alarm system. Could he get out without causing a similar disturbance? I sure. He couldn't, could he? That means that guy must be floating around here somewhere. Exactly. Now, I propose that you spread the alarm, Mr. Carlton. And, Inspector, we conduct an immediate search of the ground. A man with two large paintings in his arms would have little chance of escaping unnoticed. Hey, Bart. Yes, Inspector? I thought we were going to hunt for Brian Quirk. Doggone it, all you've done since we got out here is to walk around peering into windows. I'm not peering into windows. No? Inspector. Well, then what are you doing? I'm, uh, checking the burglar alarm. Checking Inspector. the burglar alarm. For God's sake, why? We know they work. Well, there might be one that doesn't. Suppose one of Carlton's servants were in cahoots with Quirk. He might have disconnected the system on one of the windows. Now, wait a minute, but that isn't what you're doing. Uh, it isn't? Uh... Why, Inspector? Because we know that one of the servants didn't disconnect the system. How do we know it? Because the whole doggone system went off when Quirk entered the house. <laughs> you caught up with me that time, didn't you, Inspector? Yeah, I caught up with you. <laughs> now, what the heck are you up to? Uh, uh, what do you mean, uh, uh, I found it. Found what for crying out loud? I found it. 
Inspector, yeah? What's the matter? Someone's coming. Step back into the shadows. Well, okay. Hey, it's the girl. Well, she looks more frightened than ever. Yeah, look at the way she's sneaking along. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce. She's calling you, Bart. All right, Laura. Over here. Oh, Mr. Yeah, that's him and me, too. Oh, thank heaven. I've been looking everywhere for you. Now, there's one for the book. The last time we saw you, you couldn't get away fast enough. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Yeah, we're sorry, too, but look, lady. Inspector. Huh? What was it that you didn't know, Laura? I, I didn't know who you were. Not really. Oh, you didn't. Well, how do you know now? I heard you and Mr. Carlton talking in the room where the paintings were. Oh, eavesdropping, eh? Well, Inspector, huh? will you stop your prattling for a minute and let Laura talk? Now, listen, but Keep quiet. Huh? So when you found out who we were, you came looking for us. Why, Laura? Because... Oh, Mr. Drake, I'm frightened. I want to get away from here. I, I thought you might help me. What were you frightened of, Laura? I don't know. The very atmosphere of the place. There's something dreadfully wrong. Oh, yes, but something particular must have happened to make you afraid. It did. Two weeks ago, Leopold was murdered. And then tonight when I was playing the organ... Yes, exactly what happened when you were playing your organ. I'm not sure exactly. I felt that someone was behind me, just standing there, and I was petrified. I didn't know what to do. So I kept on playing with one hand and tried to reach into my pocket for the gun that Mr. Carlton had given me. And just as I turned, the alarm started. I fired the gun and... And then I just I it. But you didn't actually see anyone. No... Oh, I don't know. There might have been someone. It was terrible. Oh, you poor kid. Now, look, there's just one more question I'd like to ask, Laura. Yes? Why haven't you given up your job and gone back to Miami before now? I wanted to, but Mr. Carlton begged me to stay. He raised my salary and gave me the gun and showed me how to use it. Uh He was awfully nice. He said that if another attempt were made to steal the paintings, he wouldn't try to hold me any longer. Well, Laura, I think that after tonight, your troubles will be over. Inspector? Inspector! Yeah, what do you want? Well... What the deuce is the matter with you? Oh, you mean I can speak now? Do I mean you could... <laughs> Inspector, you're magnificent. I see here, both of you. Yeah, what is it? This is a spot where the wires connecting Mr. Carlton's alarm system enter the house. So what? So in a minute, Inspector, I want you to get out your jackknife, bear the wires, press them together, and set off the alarm. You want to hear the bells ring again, Don't eh? Don't sarcastic, Inspector. Laura, the minute the alarm starts, the guards will come running. I want you and the inspector to pretend that you saw someone running through the shrubbery toward the wall and give chase with him. Well, I'll do my best. Fine. And uh, you, inspector? Okay, okay. But what is the great Barton Drake going to be doing all this time? Believe it or not, inspector, the great Barton Drake is going to be returning Ambrose Carlton paintings to the spot where we first saw them hanging. Just a minute, Mr. Carlton. It wasn't our fault Brian Quirk got away. Whose fault was it, then? You were both outside the house when the alarms went off. Well, you were outside, too, and so were all your guards. Sarah, there's no point in you staying longer. If you'll come up to my study, I'll give you your check. All right, you can ride back to town with us. Oh, thank you, Inspector Denton. Very decent of you, Denton. Thanks. I suppose your Mr. Drake will expect me to pay him the $10,000 I promised, even though my paintings have been stolen. I'll expect you to pay me the $10,000, Mr. Carlton. But not because your paintings have been stolen. Where the devil did you come from, Drake? And what do you mean by that remark? Which remark, Mr. Carlton? About your paintings? They haven't been stolen, you know. Haven't been stolen? Nonsense. You saw with your own eyes. Come in here, please. This is the room where the paintings were kept, isn't it? How the devil did you know? Your complicated system of rooms and hallways isn't as complicated as they at first seemed, Mr. Carlton. Look over there, please. Good heavens. The paintings. Hanging right where they were before. Well, I'll be an oversized crocodile. Bart, how did you do it? Before I answer that, Inspector, I want to explain how I solved the two-week-old murder of Leopold, Mr. Carton's servant. Solved? Drake, you don't mean that you yes, know... Yes, I do mean, Mr. Carton. I'll explain by asking a few questions. First, why didn't Brian Quirk steal the paintings on the day when he gained admission to the grounds and murdered Leopold? Well, I can answer that. I prefer that you didn't, Mr. Carlton. I have my own answer. But look here. The reason he didn't want the paintings stolen is because he couldn't dispose of them if he did steal them. But I've already explained... Not to my satisfaction, you haven't, Mr. Carlton. Second, how did Quirk gain admission to Hurricane Manor? You've made the place impregnable, Mr. Carlton. You were too thorough. What do you mean? The alarms did... The alarms had nothing to do with Quirk's visit. Quirk was already inside. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous, Mr. Carlton. Clever. There's only one man who would benefit by the theft of your painting. 
He could do so only if the paintings were insured against burglary. And the only burglar who would attempt to steal them would be a man such as Brian Quirk, who would keep them for their beauty's sake. I see. And I suppose you know the identity of Brian Quirk? Yes, I do, Mr. Carlton. You are Brian Quirk. Mr. Drager, it's so good to get away from that terrible place. I can hardly believe it. Yes, I can appreciate your point of view, Laura. I think it's wonderful the way you figured out that Mr. Carlton was really Brian Quirk. Thank you, Laura. And I also think it was wonderful the way you took the gun away from him when he tried to shoot Inspector Danton. Thank you again, Laura. Um, there's one thing that bothers me, though. Oh? How, What's that? How did you know the paintings were hidden in a false panel behind the real panel where they were originally hung? There's several reasons. Carlton, or Brian Quirk, had gone to elaborate plans to have his paintings legitimately stolen. The murder of Leopold and the soundings of the alarms, they were all designed to give an impression that someone was definitely after them. And Mr. Carlton knew that even he couldn't get the stolen goods out of the house, so he decided to hide them in the house itself. That's right. You were part of the plan to make everything seem logical. Because of all that had happened, you were certain that someone was actually trying to get into the house and steal the paintings. Isn't that so? Oh, yes. I'd become so jittery that I kept imagining things. How did you know the paintings were hidden behind the panel? Well, for one thing, when pictures are removed from the wall on which they've been hanging for some time with light on them, there's always a faint outline of their shape. And there were no outlines on the false panel? That's right. Also, the pictures were hung from brackets in the molding above. And there was no sign of a bracket when the false panel appeared. I was quite sure that Brian Quirk would never stop to remove the bracket. Oh, Mr. Drake, you're simply wonderful. Ah, uh, nuts. Oh, well. You're still there, are you, Inspector? Gotten over your gripe yet? No. No? Well, you will, I'm sure, when we reach Miami Beach. Are we going to stop there? Of course, Inspector. We've got to have a look at those bathing beauties. Say, but that's, well... But, Mr. Drake, I thought that... Not at all, Laura. Not when I have such charming company as you. Not when there are bathing beauties to observe. It's going to be a pleasure to forget that mystery is my hobby. Mystery is my hobby. Today's story took place last fall. Paul Arno, the lifelong friend of mine, called me on the phone to report a murder. At the moment, Paul was unaware that only a few hours previously, his wife, Brenda, had had an unexpected caller. Yes? Hello, Pop. Now, don't tell me you're the great Paul Arno. I beg your pardon? Look here, you can't come bursting in this way. Who are you, anyway? I asked you first, Pop. Who are you? I'm Roberts, Mr. Arnold's butler. But... <laughs> well, what do you know? Toots did all right for itself. Toots? Sure, Toots. You mean you never heard of Toots? No, naturally not. There's no one here by that name. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Whoa. Toots would like... Hey. Toots. Well, I'll be a cross-eyed lizard. Say, if you ain't the Tony, pretty... Tony, please. Huh? What's the matter? Tony, we're not alone. Oh. Oh. Oh, I, I get it. <laughs> it's Nibs, am I tell your old man. Huh? If this person is annoying you, Mrs. Arnold, No, no, I... no. It, it's quite all right, Robert. You may go. But, madam... You may go, Robert. Very well, madam. Well, what do you know? Good you've done that like a lady. Yes, sir, you've done it just like a lady. I am a lady, Tony. Huh? <laughs> a lady, huh? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Let's take it easy. <laughs> this is Tony Irwin you're talking to. Remember? When did you get off, Tony? Oh. Ah, so that's it, huh? I got you worried, eh, baby? Oh, oh, no, You're Tony, thinking no, that I'm sore because I come home and find you married to this panty waist. Uh... And why should you be sore, Tony? That's what I was saying to the boys just this morning. The boys? Yeah. Some of the boys said, uh, Tony, you ought to be sore at Toots, they said. But why, Tony? Why? That's what I told them. Why? I says, how did Toots know that I was going to get sprung after only doing a couple of years? Tony, please. Double cross? Uh-huh. 
No, sir. I laughed at him. Why I says toots wouldn't double-cross nobody. I didn't double-cross you, Tony. Sure, sure, sure you didn't. That's what I'm saying, baby. You wouldn't double-cross nobody. Thank you, feel that way. You bet. <laughs> baby, I'm proud of you. <laughs> you got class. I, uh, always figured you'd make the grade if you got the break. Yes, Tony? I ain't like some guys. Some of them boys... <laughs> You know what they wanted me to do? What? <laughs> Take that Chuck Pizarro, for instance. <laughs> There's that character. Well, what did Chuck say? Why, he says, look, Tony, don't be a dope. Toots is in a chips, he says. Look, he says, she used to be your girl, didn't she? Okay, do one up and clip her for a few hundred bucks. <laughs> She'll never miss it, he says. And what did you say, Tony? Nothing doing, I told him. Not me. I ain't that kind of a guy, see? Thank you, Tony. I ain't that kind of a guy, I says, who'd stool on a friend. Not even if she, uh, did double-cross me. Tony, I didn't. So what if Toots would pay off to keep me from telling about the weekend we spent together? Tony, that's not so. <laughs> sure, 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 it ain't. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, this Paul Arnold don't know it ain't so. What do you mean? Well, it's like this, baby. Suppose this Paul Arnold was told you used to be a burly Q dancer. Oh, Tony, you wouldn't. Suppose he got to know about you and Jerry the Duke in that nightclub raid. Oh, Tony, please. Suppose he told and was told about you and me and I showed him some pictures. Paul wouldn't believe you. He'd throw you out of the house. The way I figure it, baby, Arnold could check them things. He'd find they was true. Then, when I mentioned about that weekend... Stop it, Tony, stop it. <laughs> What's the matter, baby? What do you want, Tony? Want? Me? <laughs> not a thing, baby, not a thing. Yes, you do. What is it? Baby, you got me all wrong. You know, I wouldn't put the bite on you for nothing. Of course, since it's uh, getting along towards Christmas. Oh, I see. Very well, Tony, I'll give you a Christmas present. Ah, swell, baby. Swell! Wait! The place is over here behind these curtains. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. No, you don't. I'll just go along, too, huh? Maybe you got some ideas about, uh, telephoning? Hmm. Huh. <laughs> this is a kind of a cute idea, ain't it? Go back where you were, Tony. I'll not... Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of a cute idea. Big, heavy curtains hanging on the wall, just like there wasn't this little alcove behind them. If you think I'm going to open this safe with you watching me, you're crazy. Yeah, kind of cozy, too. Just big enough for us two. Tony. Tony, don't look at me. Like come that. here. Tony, you come keep your hands off come me. Come here, come here. <laughs> Just us two. Oh, like it used to be, huh? Come here. Take it easy, baby. Take it easy. Maybe we can make another deal. What's that? There's someone else. Hey, who turned off the lights? <laughs> Drake speaking. Hello, Bart. This is Paul Arnold. Paul Arnold. Well, well, Paul. It's good to hear your voice. How are you? Right now, I'm not so good, Bart. Hmm? There's a dead man lying in my living room with a bullet through his heart. What? Yeah, he was murdered. Murdered? How do you know? Well, my wife was standing beside him, and my butler was standing in the doorway and saw it. My sister was in the hall and heard it happen. And by the way, there's a guy here named Danton who has accused practically everyone of making it happen. Danton? Not Inspector Noah, then. That's the guy. Know him? <laughs> yes, slightly. Tell the inspector, Paul, that you've talked to me and I'm uh, on my way out. And don't worry about him. Uh, the old boy's bark is worse than his bite. Hello, Bart. Hello, Inspector. Come on in. Thank you. I'm waiting for you. You got my message, huh? No, Inspector. What message? What message? Didn't the babe call you? What babe? Arnold's sister. I was busy and I asked her to get in touch with you. I thought she did. I'm sorry, Inspector. I haven't heard a female voice in a matter of hours, worse luck. Oh, no? Then how'd you know about this murder? How do you happen to be here? Paul Arnold called me. Arnold? Why, that... Hey, what do you think he's getting away with? Hello, Bart. Glad to see you. I'm glad to see you, Paul. It's been a long time. More than a year. I've been in the service, you know. Yes, I certainly do know. Huh. Wasn't I at your going-away party? <laughs> what a time. Uh, 
pardon me for interrupting. You two gents don't happen to know each other, do you? Oh, and I are old friends, Inspector. We've known each other for years. We were roommates in college, Inspector. Well, isn't that sweet? Unless somebody thinks up some excuses mighty fast, somebody's going to be cellmates in Sing Sing. Now, look... Always the man of duty, eh, Inspector? By the way, have you identified the corpse? Sure, it was a punk named Tony Irwin. He was doing a stretch for Grand Larson and got let off for good behavior. I see. And what was Tony Irwin doing here? Well, obviously, his motive was robbery. His body was found lying near the wall safe. Yeah, and there was a gun lying beside him with one bullet discharged. Look, Bart. Come over here. Yes, Inspector. You better come along, Paul. Yes, I think I'd better. Your friend, the Inspector, has ideas. (laughs) And I can guarantee you'll have a lot more before we get much farther in this case. Yes, Inspector? You see these four tears hanging against the wall? Yes, yes, I see. Look like decorations, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yes, they do. Okay, now I swing them out like this on that crane they're hung on, and what do you see? Well, well, a dead man on the floor, a gun beside him, and a small safe fitted into a sort of an alcove. That's right. Now, when I got here a couple of hours ago, things looked exactly as they do now. Well, and what have you been doing for the past two hours, Inspector? What have I been doing? I've been lining up the suspects. I've been waiting for you. I've been looking oh, for... All right, Inspector. All right. Now, who are your suspects? Well, Mrs. Arnold admits being right here when it happened. Now, just a minute, Inspector. Brenda didn't do this. You can't Keep say... your shirt on, Bob. I didn't say she did it. I only said she was a suspect. How did Brenda happen to be here, Paul? Well, she came into the room and saw movement behind the curtain and decided to investigate. Mm-hmm. What happened? This Tony, whatever his name is, was tinkering with a safe. Just as Brenda looked behind the curtain, the lights went out. There was a shot. Brenda screamed and ran out of the room. That's her story. Now, look here, Dan. Never mind, Paul. The inspector sounds much worse than he means to. Oh, is that so? Inspector, now, have you checked the fingerprints on the guns? That's being done now. Hmm. How about the safe? What about the safe? Well, uh, if Mrs. Arnold were telling the truth, as you seem to doubt, Inspector, Tony's prints would be on the safe. Huh. That's right, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, I'll have the boys check. Good. And uh, tell me. Who are your other suspects? Roberts the butler, for one. Why? He claims he heard Mrs. Arnold talking with someone in here. Just as he opened the door, the lights went off. Roberts says he saw someone standing near the door to the hall across the room. Then the shot came. Mm. Did Roberts see where the shots came from? Yep. He says the guy that was standing near the other door fired it. But he didn't recognize the other party. No. He only got a glimpse. Victor, why do you suspect Roberts? Because he must have been lying. That gun right there is the one that killed Irwin. Oh, you're sure of that, Inspector? Sure, I'm sure. You know, I don't make idle statements, Bart. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Whom else do you suspect? Arnold's sister, Agatha. Why, that's ridiculous. Aggie's so scared of firearms, she won't even look at one. Yeah? And why didn't she call Drake when I asked her to? I'll tell you why, bub. She's the guilty party, and she knew that if Drake got on the job, he'd prove she was guilty. Inspector, let's not make idle statements, remember? Paul, it looks to me as though you're the only one that's in the clear in this case. Yes, and I'm sure I wouldn't be if I hadn't happened to be on a plane coming back from Boston at the time the murder was committed. Oh. That checks. I called the airport. A Paul Arnold left on the plane that took off from Boston at 6.30 p.m. He couldn't have gotten here before 9 o'clock and the murder took place at 7.30 p.m. Well, thanks for that much, anyhow. Don't mention it, Bob. We always aim to please. And stop calling me Bob. Bart, it seems to me your friend, the inspector, is determined to make a complicated plot out of a purely simple case. Yeah, well, Bart, it seems to me that your friend, Bob Arnold, is talking out of turn. What's simple about it, Bob? Well, anyone with any sense wouldn't ask. This man, Irwin, is the next convict sent up for larceny. Obviously, he came here with the idea of robbing my safe. Okay, so then what happened? We already know what happened. Someone shot him. See what I mean, Bart? Everybody wants to get into the yard. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. The inspector is right. Sorry. Why Tony Irwin is here is unimportant. Somebody murdered him. It's the inspector's job to find out who. Okay, I guess you're right. The only thing that we're sure of is that you are not the guilty party because you were on that plane. Well, Brenda isn't guilty either. I appreciate how you feel, Paul, but still the inspector... I beg your pardon, sir. Yes, Robert, what is it? Uh, there's a Mr. Harrison on the phone, sir. He'd like to talk to you. Harrison? I don't know any Harrison. What's he want? Well, he said something about a ticket. A t- oh, oh, yes. Of course. I, I'll talk to him, Robert. Very good, sir. If you'll pick up the extension. And no, I'll... I'll take it in the library. Very good. Excuse me, Bart. I'll be back in a minute. Take your time, Paul. No hurry. Harrison, eh? He doesn't know him. 
Inspector, what are you doing? I'm listening in on that conversation over this extension telephone. Inspector, gentlemen, don't do that sort of thing. I'm not a gentleman. I'm a cop. Well, at least keep your hand over the mouthpiece. I've got my hand over the mouthpiece. Ah. Something interesting, Inspector? Yeah, something very interesting. Well, I'll be... What, Inspector? What? How good a friend of yours is this, Paul Arnold? Well, the best. I've known him for years. You think he's on the up and up, eh? Yes, yes, I gamble. That's too bad. Why? But I hate to tell you this. Arnold wasn't on the plane. What do you mean, he wasn't on the plane? That guy Harrison that Arnold was talking to, he used the plane ticket that Arnold bought. He just called to thank Arnold. But Paul Arnold was here in New York at the time Tony Irwin was murdered. <laughs> What are you doing? I... I'm packing. I'm leaving you, Paul. Leaving me? Why? Because I... Because I think it'll be best for both of us. Oh, then... Then you've stopped loving me. Oh, no, Paul. Well, what else am I to think? Well, I'm not very proud of my past, Paul. Among other things, I... I was a dancer in a burlesque show. And you're ashamed of it. Oh, no, no, I'm not ashamed. I... I did nothing to be ashamed of. Then why? Because... Because I met you, Paul. Because I fell in love with you. Because because I wanted so desperately to have you love me. And I knew that, that Paul Darnell could only fall in love with a lady. He did. What? I said, Paul Arnold did fall in love with a lady. You're that to, lady. I'm trying to be kind. You're pitying me. I can't stand pity, Paul. No, I. No, no, look, Brenda, listen to me. I've known for the last three months about... Well, about your past. You... You've known? Yes, sure. Tony Irwin called on me. He told me all about you, even threatened blackmail. And you didn't believe him? Well, I found that everything he told me was true. But why didn't you tell me? But why should I worry the girl I love with something that was completely unimportant? Oh, Paul. Oh, there, there, you poor kid. Kiss me, Paul. Hold me close. Oh, darling, what a fool I've been. No such thing. I should have warned you. Irwin waited until things quieted down, then tried his blackmailing stunt on you. That's why I didn't go to Boston. I was worried. You... You didn't go to Boston? No. At the last minute, I had a hunch. I gave my ticket to a man named Harrison at the airport. In fact, he just called me on the phone to thank me. Then... Then you were here when... When When Irwin was shot? Yes. I came in the back way just as the shot was fired. But you didn't... Shoot, Irwin... (laughs) <laughs> no, darling, I didn't get the chance. Someone beat me to it. Paul, listen to me. Does Barton Drake know that you weren't on the plane? No, why? Then you've got to tell him, Paul. If he finds out that you were lying... Nonsense. Might... Let Bart have his fun. But it isn't only Drake, Paul. It's, it's Inspector Danton. Oh, Paul, can't you understand how important this is? Drake's clever. He might prove that, that you... Brenda, can... you don't think that I... <laughs> oh, darling, <laughs> come here to me. Listen, Bart's my best friend. Don't worry about him. And even if I did kill Tony Irwin, I've got the best alibi in the world. Look, Bart. Hmm? When are you going to give up and admit that your friend Arnold is the guy we want? Why should I, Inspector? Why should I, he asked. Because all the evidence we've uncovered points to his guilt, that's why. What evidence, Inspector? What evidence? Now, look, Bart, I'm a patient man. You know that. Yes? Paul Arnold had a motive. He wasn't on that plane and... And we're keeping that knowledge to ourselves, Inspector. I don't want Paul ever to suspect that we broke his alibi. Oh, you don't? This isn't a game, you know, Bart. Just because the guy's a good friend. What other evidence we've the points to Paul's guilt, Inspector? His sister knows we were he, he was here for one thing. Mm-hmm. I just talked to her. She admits that that's why she didn't do as I asked and call you. Because she thought that Paul had shot Irwin? Sure. Hmm? She didn't want to see her own brother go to the chair. Oh, Inspector, that's weak. Very weak. Oh, yeah? 
Well, there's the gun lying beside the corpse. From which the fingerprints have been carefully wiped. So far, you haven't mentioned anything that would stand up in court. Okay, okay. How about the fact that no fingerprints were found on the safe? Mm, Yes, that proves that Mrs. Arnold was lying, doesn't it? She said she stepped around the curtain and saw Irwin tinkling with the safe. Yeah, but if you just let me talk to... You want to see me, sir? Yes, Robert. Will you ask Mr. and Mrs. Arnold to step down here, please? Yes. Thank you. Now, Inspector, what was it that you were about to say? I was going to say if you'd just let me talk to Arnold, I... <laughs> you'd sweat it out of me, Inspector. Well, how are you going to find out if a man is guilty if you don't ask him any questions? Well, you'll get your chance to ask questions in a very few minutes, Inspector. I will? Mm-hmm. As soon as Paul and Brenda get here, I'm going to have the crime reenacted. That ought to be fun. I can hardly wait. Now, let's not be sarcastic, Inspector. I'm not only... Hello, Paul. Brenda. Come in, please. Bye, uh... Brenda and I have just had a little talk. There's something we want to tell you. I'm sorry, Paul, but that'll have to wait. We've something more important to do now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If the guy wants to talk, let him. It's really quite important, Mr. King. I'm sure it is, Brenda, but it'll still have to wait. Inspector, will you ask Roberts to step in here, please? Now, listen, Barnard. And, Inspector, will you also ask Paul's sister, Agatha, to stand in the doorway to the dining room? That's where she claimed she was when the shot was fired, wasn't it? Sure, but... Fine. Hurry along, Inspector. We'll have everything ready by the time you get back. Okay, okay, only I'm more used to giving orders than taking <laughs> Now, Brenda, if you stand over there near the curtains in the exact spot where you were when the lights went out... I will. Only if you'll listen to what Paul has to say. I'm sorry. What Paul has to say, we'll have to wait. Now, wait a minute, Bart. This may change your whole outlook on the situation. I'm sorry, that's impossible, too, Paul. Listen, I appeal to you. If Brenda won't cooperate... She'd I cooperate can... if you weren't so doggone rude. I'm sorry. There are times when a man in my position has to appear rude. Not to my wife, you don't. Whose wife it is doesn't matter. It does in this case. Now, listen, All Bart. right, Robbie. Inside. Now, now, just a minute, Inspector Jenkins. Pipe down, Gramp, and do as you're told. Dad, and take your hands off Roberts. He's done nothing. Well, now, what's happened to the big hat? Happy family I left a few minutes ago. Never mind a wife, cracks chum. But I thought you were a friend of mine. Friendship ceases where murder's involved, Paul. Now listen to me, all of you. You're going to do as I say, or Inspector Danton will take the three of you down to headquarters and lock you up. Now you're talking my language, Bart, old boy. Uh, so this is when I get when I ask a friend to help me out. Oh, what's the use, Paul? If this is the kind of person Bart and Drake is, and what we have to say won't matter anymore. Brenda, you're 100% right. All right, all right. If it's going to make you any happier, what do you want us to do? Thank you, Paul. Brenda, will you uh, stand over near the curtains, please? Yes, all right. This is where I was when the shot was fired. Fine. And where was Irwin standing? Directly in front of the safe. Hmm. How were the curtains arranged? Well, they they were halfway open. About like this. Thank you. Stay there, please. Now, Robert, if you'll just stand uh, here in front of this door. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes? It wasn't near this door that I was standing when I saw the shot fired. It was over there near the library door. Yes, I remember your thing. So, however, if you don't mind, I prefer that you stand here. Now, look here, Bart. If you think that Roberts had anything to do with Irwin's killing, you're crazy. He's been with me for years. We'll go into that later, Paul. Inspector, where's Paul's sister, Agatha? She's out in the hall near the dining room door, bored stiff. Look here, sir. If it were Miss Agatha, I mean, the dining room door is right behind where I'm standing. I I mean... Well, what do you mean, Robert? Are you implying that Agatha murdered Tony Irwin? Oh, no, sir. Of course not. Then keep quiet. Say, everyone's getting mad at everyone, aren't they? Mm. Paul, will you go over and stand near the door to the library, please? Okay. So now I'm standing here. What am I supposed to do? Look over towards the curtains. Can you see Brenda standing behind them? Sure I can. They're half open. Excellent. All right, Robert. Tony Irwin was supposedly standing in front of the safe, farther back in behind the curtains, when you stepped into the room. Is that correct? Uh, Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, Roberts, I want you to raise your hand as though you had a gun in it. Point it in the manner you claim to have seen the figure point it and fire. Yes, sir. Uh, The figure was standing here. He aimed deliberately... Good heavens. Well, Robert. You... You tricked me. The guy has got a gun in his hand. Hey, someone turn off the Look light. Out, Agatha, he's coming at you. Turn off the light. Which way did he go, Inspector? Through this door. Come on. Right. Let go of me! 
It's Agatha. He's holding her in front of him. Hand back for our shoot. So am I. Look out, Inspector. You hit the girl. That's me, brother. All right, Roberts. You got one chance. That does it. You blundering idiot. You hit Agatha. No, I didn't. I hit Roberts. Nice work, Inspector. Come on. Agatha. Agatha, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Yeah, he's dead, lady. Inspector Danton never misses. So you knew all the time that it was Roberts, huh, Bart? No, no, I uh, only suspected. The thing that puzzled me is the fact that he had no particular motive. But he did have a motive, Mr. Drake. Oh? Roberts knew that Paul and I were happy. He apparently overheard my conversation with Tony Irwin and realized that our happiness was being jeopardized. Roberts has been in our family for years. He was just being loyal. You know, I, I wish somehow we could repay the debt. Well, I think Roberts would feel repaid if he knew how things had turned out. Yes, I, I suppose you're right. Oh, Paul. Oh, now, now, darling. And can I say something? Yes, of course you can, Inspector. All I want to know is, how did you know that Roberts was it? Well, well that's a fair enough question, Inspector. Robert said he glimpsed a figure standing in the doorway that led to the hall. He said he saw that figure take deliberate aim and fire. I get it. Anyone standing in the doorway leading to the hall couldn't see the two people standing behind the curtain. Ah, that's right, Inspector. Robert, standing in the doorway of the library, could see them plainly. So he assumed that the figure could see them, too. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, how did you know that uh, this figure just didn't fire blindly and hit Tony Irwin by mistake? Inspector, I'm ashamed of you. Because if he had... There would have been a bullet hole in the curtain, now wouldn't there? Yeah. (laughs) And there wasn't, was there? No, no, there wasn't. By the way, Paul, what was it that you and Brenda were so anxious to tell me a little while ago? Why, well, Bart, it it really doesn't matter now. No, it it isn't important at all. (laughs) As a matter of fact, it, it had something to do with my alibi. Bart, it would kill you if you knew. It would, eh? Uh, Bart... Shall we tell him? Absolutely not, Inspector. I told you I'd like Paul to think that... I don't mean that. No? What do you mean? Tell him, you know what? Huh? Well, maybe they won't think they were so gall darn smart after all. Oh, I see what you mean, Inspector. Yes. Paul, whenever you think of how you put one over on Barton Drake, just remember that mystery is my hobby. <laughs> Mrs. Sally Anders had been found dead in the kitchen of her home in the town of Walkerville. An autopsy revealed that she died of poisoning. Fred Anders, her husband, accused of murdering his wife, had escaped capture, and for the past ten days had been a fugitive from justice. On the evening of the tenth day, I had an unexpected caller at my apartment. Yes? Are you Barton Drake? Yes, I'm Drake. Will you come in? Yeah. You alone here? Yes, I'm alone. Sit over there, please. I'll talk from here. As you like. Well? Well, what? He said that you talk from here. What would you like to talk about? I guess you don't know who I am. Oh, yes, I'm quite aware of who you are. You're Fred Anders, wanted for the murder of your wife, Sally Anders. You're a cool one, Drake. I heard you were pretty clever. I get Fred Andrews. What are you going to do about it? Nothing at all. As long as you keep your hand in the pocket of your jacket. <laughs> That's smart. I've got a gun in this pocket, Drake. I haven't the slightest doubt of it, Mr. Andrews. Uh, I guess I will sit down. Fine. There's a comfortable chair. I'll sit over here where you can keep your eye on me. Yes. It's a good idea. Maybe you're wondering why I dropped in on you like this, huh? I suspect that your purpose is to tell me you didn't murder your wife. Yeah? How'd you figure that out? Didn't take a great deal of figuring, Anders. Obviously, there'd be no other reason why you'd pay me a call. Uh 
Well, that's what I call being real smart. Thank you again. Now, Drake, listen to me. I didn't do it. So help me, I didn't. The police seem to think otherwise. Oh, the police, those dumb, flat-footed cops. Come, come, Mr. Anders. The police aren't always wrong. All the evidence pointed to your... What case. evidence? The fact that Sally and I had quarreled? The fact that I had threatened to kill her? Did that prove a man guilty of murder? The fact that you ran away and have been in hiding ever since your wife's death doesn't help your case any, Mr. Anders. It doesn't prove me guilty yet. I'm not a fool. What would you have done? Never having killed anyone, I don't know. And I haven't killed anyone either. Thank you. You've got to help me. Oh? Now, Drake, listen to me. You don't know what it's like to be hunted and hounded, to be afraid of your own shadow, to jump every time a car backfires. No, I'm afraid I don't. I haven't slept for days, Drake. I haven't eaten. I, I can't stand it much longer. I think I'm going crazy. I think I can appreciate how you must feel. Help me, Drake. You have a reputation for shooting square. I've got money. I'll pay you. That's hardly an inducement, Mr. Anders. If you're guilty, it would be impossible for me to prove you innocent. But I'm not guilty, I tell you. Would I take a chance in coming here if I were? Would I be willing to risk everything on the one hope that you'd give me a break? No, Mr. Anders, I don't think you would. Well, then... And you believe me, huh? For the moment, I'll withhold my opinion. And I'll give you a chance to prove your faith in me. I'll do anything. Believe me, I will. Then give yourself up to the police. Give myself up? Yes. If you know that you're innocent and you believe I can help you, there should be no objection. So that's your game. I haven't any game, Manders. You're a fugitive from the police. Why, you dirty, double-crossing rat. So you want me to give myself up? You want to get credit for capturing Fred Anders by talking him into it? So that's the kind of a guy you are. Those huh? are my terms, Anders. Take them or leave them. Take them or leave them, huh? I'll show you what I'll do to him. down that gun, Anders. A second murder isn't going to help there you. There hasn't me. been a first yet. <laughs> Look, Bart, let me get this straight. This guy, Anders, came up to your apartment and tried to get you to investigate the murder of his wife. Yes, that's right, Inspector. You refused, and he took a swipe at you with his gun. Yes, and naturally I grappled with him, and the gun went off. The bullet missed, but he knocked you out by hitting you with the gun barrel. That's right. He knocked me out, all right. Hmm. Hmm. What, Inspector? I smell something. Oh, you know what you should have done the minute you came to your senses? No, no, I don't. What is You should have called the police and reported what had happened. After all, Anders is a fugitive from... But just... I did call the police and reported what happened, Inspector. Huh? What do you mean? You said yourself that you called me the minute you woke I up. I did, Inspector. You're a policeman, aren't you? Huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I guess I am at that. Yeah, but look. Oh, now. come, come, Inspector. You'd like credit for capturing the murderer of Sally Anders, wouldn't you? Sure. You mean you know where Fred Anders is hiding? I'm not interested in where Fred Anders is hiding, Inspector. I'm only interested in apprehending the murderer of his wife. That's where we're going now. Oh, my gosh. Do you mean that Anders talked you into believing he was innocent? No, on the contrary, Inspector. I talked him into talking me into it. What kind of double talk is that? <laughs> Fred Anders, Inspector, had a chance to kill me. He didn't, even though I made him mad enough to want to. So that proves he didn't murder his wife, eh? Well, we were struggling for the gun. I warned Anders that a second murder wouldn't help him any. Mighty decent of you. Anders replied that there hadn't been a first yet. <laughs> you fellas didn't discuss the weather, too, did you? So you see, Inspector, I did my duty as a citizen by trying to capture a fugitive. And I discovered that the fugitive was innocent of the crime as charged. Now, that makes sense. That does. Look. And uh, now I've eased my conscience by reporting the incident to the police, and everything's fine. I knew I smelled something. Somehow or other, I always turn out to be the fall guy in these deals. <laughs> no such thing, Inspector. When we return from Walkerville, you're going to be a hero who captured the murderer of Sally Anders. <laughs> What are we stopping here for? This isn't where Fred Anders lived. I saw pictures of the place. No, this is the home of Miss Emma Bemis, Inspector. Oh, the babe who discovered the body, eh? Yes, that's right. I see she's working in that garden patch over there. Come on, let's go find out. Why, 
Well, she sees us coming. Say, she's as good looking as a picture. Yes, I see she is. Good morning. Are you Miss Emma Bemis? Oh, my goodness. You must be strangers around here. Everybody knows I'm Emma Bemis. Uh-uh, one of those. Yeah, hmm? Bill Inspector. Yes, we are strangers in Walkerville, Miss Bemis. I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Denton. Hi. Barton Drake? What a wonderful name. Well, what's the matter with Stanton? That name's been in our family for years. Well, you're stepping right in my petunia bed. Oh, you big Now, don't get excited. I'm not stepping on your doggone petunias. Those big feet. Now I'll have to plant the whole plot over again. Well, for God's sake, how did I know? Stand over there, Inspector. You'll be all right. Uh, I'm all right, anyhow. Of course you are. Miss Demas, would you mind... Yes, Barton? You don't care if I call you Barton, do you? Not at all. Emma? Here mm. we go again. It's such a lovely name. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Miss, uh, uh, Emma, Inspector Danton and I are investigating the murder of Sally Anders. Sally? Yes. It was you who discovered the body, wasn't it? Sure. I mean, yes. Say, wait a minute. Are you two gentlemen officers? Well, yes. In a matter of speaking, we are. And you've got on a wild goose chase. It was Fred, Sally's husband, who murdered her. Who says so? Ebenezer Pringle says so. He's our chief of police. I, I guess I ought to know since it was I who discovered the body. Well, uh, look, lady, just because you discovered the I body... I was the most important witness at the coroner's inquest. Yeah, but... My picture uh, was in every newspaper in the country. So what? My picture's been in the newspapers, too. But they only... called me the beautiful Miss Bemis. Who lived next door? I was known as Dandy Danton, the Beau Brummel of Delancey Street. Inspector. Uh, Emma, would you mind telling us the uh, exact circumstances under which you discovered Sally Anders' body? Circumstances? Yes. There weren't any circumstances. I just went over there and found it. Oh. Well, uh, what was your reason for calling on the Anders that morning? Reason? No reason. I just decided to call on them the way neighbors do. That's no answer. Well, it should be. Sally and I had a cup of coffee together most every morning of the week. Oh, poor Sally. Why, poor Sally. Why, poor Sally? Yeah. Well, how would you like it if your husband was always threatening to murder you? I haven't got a husband. Oh, dear Inspector. Emma. Are we to understand that you knocked on the Anders' door? When no one answered it, you opened the door, walked in, and found Mrs. Anders lying on the floor. Oh, no. No, it wasn't like that at all. Oh. The door was locked. That's what made me suspicious. Well, I see. No one ever locks their doors in Walkerville. Naturally, I knew something was wrong. Naturally? And what did you do? Do I have to tell, Barton? I'd appreciate it if you would, Emma. Would you, Barton? Pardon me, if I'm in the way. Now, just keep your big feet out of the petunias, Inspector, and everything's going to be all right. Oh, is that so? Now, as you were saying, Emma, what did you do when you found the door locked? I looked through the keyhole. Well, you little rascal. And you saw Sally Anders' body lying on the floor? Yes. It was right there in front of the door. Oh, uh, then what did you do? Why, well, scream, naturally. I'll bet. And I suppose uh, somebody heard you screaming and summoned Chief Pringle? That's exactly what happened. My, you're clever, Barton. Yeah, clever. <laughs> Emma, let me tell you about the time... All that... right, Inspector. Huh? Emma, thank you very much for answering all our questions. You've helped us immeasurably. Oh. Now, come on, Dandy Denton. Get your big feet out of the petunia bed. We've got work to do. <laughs> Now, uh, look, Bart, mm -hmm. we can't just go in and bust into the Anders' home without a warrant. No one's living in the place, and... <laughs> uh, yeah? What's the matter? There is someone living in the Anders' home. I just saw a movement behind those curtains. Huh? Where? I didn't see anything. You didn't? No. That was mistaken. Mistaken, you? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Bart. You're not admitting a mistake, yes, are you? I'm sure I was mistaken. You know, my imagination's been playing tricks on me lately. Imagination, eh? Now, that's something I never expected. Come anything. along, Inspector. Let's uh, check and make sure, shall we? Yeah, yeah, that's one way of finding out. Hey, 
Where are you going? Bump the back door. The back door? But look, the front door's right here, and it's only polite. I think we'd better try the back door first, Inspector. Oh, all right. Have it your way. Hey, the place is kind of run down looking, isn't it? Yeah. It hasn't been occupied since the day of the inquest. I don't know. Well, it looks as though you did make a mistake after all. Hmm. However, let's try the door and just make sure. <laughs> it's open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything, though. Emma the Beauty just told us that no one in Walker will ever lock their doors. Miss Demas also pointed out that Sally Anders did lock her door on the day she was murdered. Come on, Inspector, let's look around. The deserted houses always give me the creeps. What do they keep the shades pulled down for? Inspector, what do you want me to shush for? There's no one here. You said yourself that you... I couldn't very well help but get it, Inspector. Miss Anders, you must be a relative of Fred Anders. Of course. I'm his sister. Now, what is it you want? What do we want? What do you think we want with everyone yelling and shooting off yelling? guns? Shooting off guns? I don't believe I understand. Don't believe you want... Now, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You mean you didn't hear any shots? Of course I didn't. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Well, I'll be a man. Furthermore, if you don't leave at once, I'll call the police. The police? I'm the police now. Look. Inspector Miss Anders, I'm Barton Drake. This is Inspector Noah Dan. Hi. Yesterday, your brother called on me in my apartment. You're and asked Barton to... Drake. Yes. But I thought. That... Well, you thought what? I. I'm glad to know you, Mister Drake. Now that the formal introductions are over, I'd like to know which one of us is nuts. I heard a shot. I heard two shots. A minute, Inspector. Huh? Miss Anders, you can only have one purpose in being in this house. You believe your brother is innocent. Oh, I do. I know he didn't kill Sally. And you hope that if you spend some time here, you'll find something that will substantiate your belief? Yes, there must be something. There must be. Yes, there is, Miss Anders. There's a good deal. It just occurred to me what it is. Inspector, I want you to pay Chief Ebenezer Pringle a visit. Ask him to let us have a copy of the report on the autopsy that was performed on Sally Ann. But wait a minute, Bart. There was a shot. Two shots. A scream. I heard him. You heard him, too. <laughs> Are you going to search the barn, Mr. Drake? Would you rather I didn't, Miss Anders? Well, I don't think there could possibly be anything in there. All right, Miss Anders. I think we can skip the barn for the time being and take a look in this lean-to. But there's nothing in there except odds and ends of farming equipment. And trash barrels, Miss Anders. Trash barrels? Yes. Uh Uh-oh. What in the world are you removing that for? Because I think it will help in proving who murdered your brother's wife, Miss Anders. By the way, was it raining on the day Sally Anders was found murdered? Raining? Yes. Why, I don't know. Wait a minute. No, it wasn't. We had a hard rain the day before. The day before? Are you sure? Yes, I'm positive. Why? I joke, Miss Anders, that's fine. Come along with me. Inspector Denton will be back in a moment and we'll... Oh, here comes Emma Bemis, yes, the busy body. I was hoping she wouldn't discover that I was staying here. <laughs> I know what you mean. Miss Bemis seems to be carrying something. The pie... She's forever baking them. It gives her an excuse to call on the neighbors. Oh, Barton! Mm-hmm. I thought you'd like... Oh. So 
Carl Anders. Well, well, I would have thought you'd have the nerve to come back here. And why shouldn't I have the nerve to come back, Emma? Why, she asked. Well, if my brother had murdered his wife... Fred didn't murder Sally. He didn't, I tell you. And don't you dare say he did. Well, I like that. Telling me he didn't do it when I found the body. When I was chief witness at the coroner's inquest. When well, your I... picture was in every newspaper in the country. Have you told Mr. Drake that that picture was taken five years ago? Why, you... I suppose you... at this point it would be appropriate for me to make a noise like a cat. Meow. And I suppose we go in the house and try one of Miss Bemis's pies. I'm sure it would taste better than... I'd rather eat poison. I can understand that. You and your brother should know all about poison, Carol Anders. Don't forget it was poison that killed Sam. You're so right. And here comes Inspector Danton with the proof. Hello, Inspector. Did you get the autopsy report? Yeah, I got it. That Ebenezer guy was kind of tough. Well, well, if it isn't Emma the beauty. Don't get fresh, Sandy Danton. What did the autopsy report reveal, Inspector Danton? Just what the newspaper said, lady. Sally Anders died of HCN poisoning. HCN? Are you sure, Inspector? Sure, I'm sure. Here it is. Right here. Death due to a dose of HCN poisoning. Traces of a mild sedative were also found. I chose that the answer. Answer to what? To the identity of the real murderer, Inspector. Miss Anders, may I have your handbag, please? My handbag? Whatever in the world. If you don't mind. No, give that back. Inspector? Yeah, I got it. Take it easy, <laughs> lady. Go of me. I knew you had something to do with this, Carol Anders. This is a thought. Miss Anders, have you a permit to carry this gun in your handbag? Isn't any of your business whether I have or not. So I wasn't nuts. I did hear some shots. And it was this babe who fired That's right, Inspector, it was. She fired them to attract our attention so we'd rush upstairs. Why? What did she want us to rush upstairs for? Tell the Inspector, Miss Anders. You're so clever. You tell him, Mr. Criminologist. I'll be glad to, Miss Anders. There was someone else in the house with you, someone you didn't want us to see. Someone else? Then it must Miss have Sanders been... shot her gun and screamed so that we'd rush upstairs and give that other person a chance to escape. Fine thing. So we let the murderer run out from under our noses, eh? You are so clever, Mr. Drake. On the contrary, Inspector. The other occupant of the house didn't escape. Miss Anders made that obvious when she asked me not to search the barn. I didn't know such things. And so, Inspector, I think it would be a good idea if you stepped over to the barn and placed Mr. Fred Anders under arrest. Shoving me, Danton. Well, Drake, this makes your double cross a hundred percent, doesn't it? Sit down, Anders. Miss Bemis was just about to cut one of her famous pies. Not for him, I wasn't. Oh, Fred, I'm sorry. Never mind, Carol. It was no fault of yours. Well, Drake, go ahead and make a hero out of yourself by sending an innocent man to the chair. I don't intend to send an innocent man to the chair, Anders. In fact, I don't intend to send a man to the chair at all. What do you mean by that? I mean, Miss Anders, it wasn't a man who murdered Sally Anders. It was a woman. Then it must have been Carol. She was the only woman mixed up in the ugly business. Wait a minute, Emma, my beauty. You were around and you're a woman or you've been overacting. The idea. That's right, Inspector. Emma was around. It was she who administered the poison. See? How <laughs> dare you say such a thing? Oh, Bart's a great hand at saying daring things, eh, Bart? Sit still, Petunia. I mean, Emma. Anders, before you left the house on the morning of your wife's murder, did you quarrel with her? Well, uh, well sure, just... I'm not denying that. What are you quarreling about? Why, uh, oh, what difference does it make? A lot. You'd been having a romance with Emma Demers, hadn't you? Uh, well, I... Hadn't you? Oh, not really. Emma and I were just, just friendly. Sally was always nagging, and Emma and I... Fred Anders, how dare you imply oh, that stop I... stop asking I... people how they dare things. Keep quiet, You quarreled you? with your wife that morning, Anders, and left in a rage. Emma was outside listening. After a while, she came in and pretended to comfort Mrs. Anders. The two women sat down over a cup of coffee to talk the thing out. Well, of all the outlandish notions. Emma had some HCN poisoning in a vial. Now, HCN is such a bad odor and taste that only a few drops would make any amount of food unpalatable. Well, there. How could I have forced Sally to take any? By first dropping a mild sedative into her coffee, Emma, which made her drowsy. Then, pretending to revive her, you forced more coffee between her lips, coffee that contained HCN poisoning. It's a lie. It's a black lie. Then you took your own cup out to the trash barrel and disposed of it. So it would appear that Sally Anders had been drinking coffee alone. Oh, he didn't. You can't prove it. I you think can. I can prove it, Miss Bemis. 
It had rained the day before. On the morning of Sally Anders' murder, you worked for a while in your petunia bed. Some of the soil clung to your shoes. You left tracks near the trash barrel. Jump in, Judas. I got some of that petunia bed soil on my shoes. You are right, Inspector. You have, and we can analyze the contents and prove that... All right, I did it. I said he wouldn't marry me because of Sally, even though he hated her. So I studied up on poison. It seemed easy. I didn't think they'd blame friends. If Drake had known about HCM... Well, Bart, here we are back at the Land Flatters Club. Mm -hmm. How about a game of chess? Mm -hmm. No, Inspector. No? What do you mean, no? We always play a game before... Come on, Mr. Gates. I'll plug it in here. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. Hello. Yes, this is Barton Drake. Oh, hello, Miss Sanders. Uh Uh-oh. What? (laughs) <laughs> You've been wondering what aroused my suspicions when Emma told me she peered through the keyhole and saw Sally. Yeah, I'd like to know about that, too. Well, <laughs> it was obvious she was lying, Miss Anders. Did you ever try to peer through the keyhole of a Yale lock? Well, I'll be... Uh... What's that? Well, that sounds very nice. Uh, 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 uh. I certainly will. You won't. Now, wait a minute, Bart. Don't forget... Be quiet, Inspector. Yeah, but look, I'm only trying to say... Well, thank you, Miss Anders. I know I'll enjoy it. Oh, you won't. It'll be a bust. Oh... What a pity. He's gone. No, I can't do that. Uh, you see, mystery is my hobby. Mystery is my hobby. began one evening last summer. Alan Fisher, a wealthy mining engineer, recently married to his young and beautiful wife, was being called upon by a young attorney named Frank Woodman. Good evening, Frank. Come in. Now, I got your message, Fisher. Don't sound it urgent. It is. I have a special case I want you to handle for me. Shall we go into the study? Okay. As I told you over the phone, I have an important engagement. I I think what I have to say will preclude the possibility of your uh, engagement. Sit over there, please. What's the idea of locking the door? Don't get alarmed. I merely want to ensure privacy. That's what I'm telling. She won't, Frank. My wife isn't home tonight. She doesn't even know that you're here. Oh. Well, what was it you wanted to see me about? Sit down. Sit down. It may take some time. To my appointment. Your appointment can wait. Cigar, Frank? All right. You know what I smoke cigars? Of course, I've forgotten. You live in a cigarette smoking generation, don't you, Frank? You and Helene. See here, Fisher. If you don't feel indulgent, old man, a lifelong habit, I'll light up. <sighs> There's nothing like an after dinner cigar, my boy. You should try it sometime. I'll stick to cigarettes. Look, what's this all about? Of course. You're curious, aren't you, my boy? Well, this case I want you to handle involves a very dear friend of mine. Do I know him? You know him, my boy, very well indeed. What's his name? Perhaps it's someone I wouldn't even be interested in representing. On the contrary, I think you will, Frank. However, for the moment, I shall withhold his identity until you decide. It's nonsense. He don't care to... He's quite an elderly man, Frank, about 60, I should judge. Recently, he had the good fortune to meet and marry a very lovely young woman. Oh, I see. One of those June and January affairs, hmm? A very apt description, my boy. However, my friend, despite his age, was sincerely and honestly in love with his young wife. He believed he could make her happy. (laughs) They always do. Do they, Frank? That's one of the things I'm curious about. As a lawyer, I felt that you could advise me. Well, it depends upon the girl, I suppose. No, that is exactly what I wanted to hear. It depends upon the girl. I don't get it. Perhaps I'd better explain further, then. For a time, my friend and his young wife were quite happy. Then one evening at a party, my friend's wife was presented to a personable young man of about her own age. Well, that usually happens, too. Yes. Thereafter, my friend lived in torment of doubt and suspicion. Your friend's story is following the usual pattern. I suppose it is. To you, a lawyer, his predicament must be an old story. Yes, and a tiring one. I'm sorry. However, there is a point in my friend's story where it deviates from the customary pattern. Oh? Yes. 
My friend, though aware of his wife's infidelity and knowing that she was perhaps more to blame for the uh, situation than the young man, did not accuse her of her disloyalty nor throw her out into the cold, cruel world. No? What did he do? Unfortunately, my friend realized that without his beautiful young wife, despite her faults, life would scarcely be worth living. <laughs> Still don't get it. You will in a moment, Frank, I'm sure. Realizing the depths to which his love went, my friend began to think of some means of removing the young man from the scene. <laughs> yes, that is killing him. Betty, you can tell your friend for me that he's a fool. He wouldn't get away with it. My friend realizes that, Frank. He knows that murder would not solve the problem. So he thought of another means of accomplishing his purpose. <laughs> another? My friend is quite wealthy, Frank. He happens to know that the young man in whom his wife is interested is... Shall we say, not too well off? I see. Coincidentally, the young man is a lawyer, Frank, like yourself. You can understand how difficult it is for struggling young lawyers these days. Yeah, no. Now, as a lawyer, Frank, I want you to advise me what to do. Would you suggest that I tell my friend to offer the young man a sum of money to leave the country? Being very subtle about it, of course. Well, no harm in trying. What sum would you suggest, Frank? I'd say the sum should be in direct ratio to the young man's fondness to your friend's wife. In other words, every man has his price. That's it. What would you say to $25,000? I'd say it wasn't enough. 50000 Well, the young man would be crazy if he took it. Why could I... He'd go on $50,000 and set himself up in business and live the life to which he'd be entitled. Entitled? You'd have to sacrifice the young wife, wouldn't you? Well, there should be some compensation for that. I see. $75,000. It's still way low. Low. Be reasonable, Frank. My, my friend loves his wife madly. She's all he has left in life. Then your friend should be willing to pay whatever amount the young man has. What would that figure be? A quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million? But that's... Well, that's out of the question, my friend. Hasn't any such amount. I think your friend is lying. He isn't, Frank. I swear it. And your friend's a fool to even think about it. Frank. What the devil's the matter? What are you telling me? Don't move. There's someone outside the French door. He has a gun. You're crazy. Oh, no, I'm not. Stay where you are. I've got a gun in this Put that gun down, you fool. Don't think you can trust me. I'm turning around. Put it down. I... Under the circumstances, Mr. Fisher, would... Excuse me, please. I think that calls for me. Of course. Yes? Hello, Brad. Hello, Inspector. What did the fingerprints show? There were two sets on the gun. Frank Woodman, Sam Fisher. I see. Anything else? Anything else? What more do you want? Something do this, Brad. We already know that Woodman was making a face of Fisher's life. Uh, Inspector, Mrs. Fisher is with me now. Uh-oh. Get down here as soon as you can, Inspector. There are some new developments that I want to discuss with you. New developments? Mm -hmm. You don't mean to suspect. As soon as you can, Inspector. Goodbye. I'm afraid that the case against Frank Woodman looks rather bad, Mrs. Fisher. Yes, I overheard what Inspector Dalton said about the fingerprints. Mr. Drake, I'm sure you're making a mistake. Frank Woodman... Unfortunately, Mrs. Fisher, there are neither witnesses nor evidence to substantiate Mr. Woodman's rather fantastic stories. And as a lawyer, he should know it. But if there were someone outside the French door... Inspector Dalton's men have covered every inch of ground outside the French doors, Mrs. Fisher. There's no evidence that anyone was there. And you then no credence to Frank's story that he picked up the gun and ran through the French doors after the slayer? Mm, I might, except for one thing. Mr. Woodman stated that an instant before your husband died, he gasped... I got him. What's so fantastic about that? Mrs. Fisher, the police medical examiner stated that your husband was killed instantly. If that is true, he couldn't have said, I got him after he was shot, could he? I see. And Roger Butler heard your husband and Mr. Woodman uh, quarreling. Woodman substantiated this. Well, I should think that the mere fact that Frank did substantiate the quarrel would... Would indicate that uh, he had a clear conscience? No, Mrs. Fisher. Woodman was merely being clever. He knew that the case against him was bad, therefore it was to his advantage to make the admission. And the fact that The fact you... that I admit being in love with Frank gives him a motive. Is that correct, Mr. Drake? Not quite. The fact that Mr. Woodman knew that you would inherit your husband's fortune when he died, and that you were in love with him, provided the motive. That's unkind. It's brutal and cruel. Murder is also brutal and cruel, Mrs. Peter. 
Are you going to arrest Frank? I'm afraid, Inspector Danton, we'll have no choice. I beg your pardon. Come in, Lewis. What have you there? The mail, sir. It just came. Shall I leave it here, Mrs. Fisher? If you don't mind, Lewis, I'll fix the letter. Oh, but Let I... him have it, Lewis. I seem to be deprived of my rights as a citizen. Why don't you go upstairs and lie down, madam? You've been wearing those heavy riding boots and that jacket all morning. You must be Thank tired. you, Lewis. I couldn't sleep, Paul. I'll remain here until it's over. Mrs. Fisher, did you ever know a man named, uh, Horace Gay? Horace Gay? Mm-hmm. What about him? This envelope addressed to you contains a newspaper clipping and states that Horace Gay escaped from prison last week. Oh, no. What do you see? Was there anything else in the envelope? No. That's all. Just a clipping. Then you do know Mr. Gay, hmm? A long time ago. He was in love with me. We were to be married. What happened? Horace worked in the bank. Funds were found missing and Horace was accused. He, uh, killed a man. Okay. Did, uh, your husband know about this? No. Telling Alan would have done no good. I'd completely forgotten. Mr. Drake. Yes? Yeah. Before they took Horace away, he, he swore that if I ever married anyone else, he'd... he'd kill him. Hmm. And you think that possibly... Yes. Yes. Oh, don't you see? It was Horace outside those French doors. It must have been. Oh, thank heavens. You can't arrest right now. You can. There, Mrs. Fisher. You mustn't get excited. Let me help you out. No, get away from me, Lewis. Well, Mr. Drake? You're really in love with Mr. Whitman, aren't you, Mrs. Fisher? Yes, I am. I'm desperately in love with him. Is it wicked to love a man and try to protect him? Not at all, Mrs. Fisher. Only I don't think you're trying to protect Frank Whitman. Okay, Bob, we spent the whole day looking for clues that don't exist. Now we're right back at the scene of the crime where we started from. When are you going to let me arrest somebody? <laughs> Inspector, you can start arresting any time you like. Whom do you want to arrest? The guy who murdered Alan Fisher, that's him. Mm, and who's that, Inspector? It's Frank Woodman. You said so yourself. <laughs> he had a motive. His fingerprints were on the gun. Oh, doggone it, Bart. I wish you wouldn't change your mind so often. I haven't changed my mind, Inspector. How do you account for that shot that came through the French door? How do I account for it? Mm-hmm. You said yourself that Woodman probably fired the shot just to throw us off. Did I? Mm. Well, the broken glass was inside the study, Inspector. That indicates that the shot came from the outside. Besides, there was only one shot fired from Fisher's gun. No, Inspector. I'm afraid there was someone outside those French doors. Well, I'll be doggone. Why are you giving me a headache? Whose side are you on, anyway? Look for crying out loud. Oh, really? Sound unhappy, Inspector. Huh. <laughs> yeah, let's see what time is it. Nine o'clock. Oh, that's odd. Yeah, isn't it, though? Every time it gets to be nine o'clock, it's odd. What's odd about it? It doesn't happen soon. I've been... Oh, hello, Whitman. Come in. I've been expecting you. I can give that back to you, Drake. I've been expecting you. Oh, that Oh, to take you off to jail, you mean? Yeah, Look, you guys, I'm tired of sitting around this house waiting for you masterminds to build a case against me. Either make a formal arrest... Oh, so you're tired of waiting for us to build a case against you, bub. Well, let me tell you something. We got a case that'll send you to the chair quicker than... Not... Us. If you have a case against me, why all this stalling? You seem pretty sure of yourself, Woodman. Sure I am. I'm a lawyer, Drake. You haven't got anything on me. I know it and you know it. So what's the game? You got enough on you to keep you sitting in this house, Bob, even if you are tired. As a matter of fact, Woodman, we are playing a game. The first half is over, and in a moment... Ah! Ah! Something Judas, listen to that! Have a telling, Commander. I think the second half of the game has begun. There's a butler at the top of the stairs. Yes, I see him. Uh, this way, gentlemen. What do you want in your conducted tour? Uh, this is Mrs. Fisher's room. Come in. Oh, Frank. Frank, it was all... Awesome. Inspector, take a look out of that window. Okay. Well, Mrs. Fisher. You're safe now, darling. Tell us what happened. I, I went to bed about an hour ago. I must have dropped off to sleep. I didn't realize how exhausted I was. Well, you poor kid. I think she can talk without you holding her in her arms, Woodman. Please stand over there. Listen, you can't. Over there, I said. Okay. Very well, Mrs. Peter. Go on with your story. It was pitch dark. 
Suddenly I woke up. Was it the shots that uh, wakened you? <laughs> Quit crying, Andre. The poor girl's upset. Woodman, one more remark out of you and you'll spend the rest of the night in jail. Go on, Mrs. Peter. No, it wasn't the shots that wakened me, Mr. Drake. I'm not sure what it was. It was pitch dark and the first thing I saw was the luminous dial of a man's watch blowing in the dark only a few feet from my head. Horrible. Go on, Mrs. Peter. What happened? Well, that's what I screamed. The man, whoever he was, must have become frightened. He ran out into the balcony, banging the screen door shut behind him. But there was a shot. Well, apparently, after he got outside, he remembered what he'd come for. I could see him standing there, silhouetted against the sky. Then he, he raised his hand and shot through the screen door. Good heavens. There's a hole through the screen, all right. Hmm. Uh, all right, how's the babe? She's all right, Inspector. By the way, Mrs. Fisher, after the shot came, did you get out of bed? No, of course not. Then who turned on the lights in this room? Uh, I did, sir. I heard Mrs. Fisher scream and came running along the hall. I opened the door and snapped on the light. Then closed it again and came back to the stairs to start the conductor tour, I suppose. Well, yes, sir. I did. I didn't think it discreet to remain in Mrs. Fisher's room when she... That stinks, Louie. For all you know, Mrs. Fisher was murdered in bed, but you were too shy to stay in the room. It's a pity some other people can't be as discreet. Oh, shut up, Junior. You're not married to the lady either. Yes. Why well, I think we got ourselves another suspect. That's ridiculous. Lewis is the most trustworthy butler I've ever known. Thank you, madam. He's also the only butler you've ever known, Mrs. Fisher. By the way, when you saw the prowler standing out in the balcony, didn't you recognize him? Recognize him? Mm-hmm. You mean that Horace... Yes, the possibility that shouldn't be overlooked, Mrs. Fisher. I'm surprised you didn't... All right, Inspector, let's get going. Yeah, sure. Good idea. Where are we going? We're going to look the grounds over for Horace, Inspector. We can't have these good people thinking themselves under suspicion that Horace is our man. Hello, Is that your friend? Yes. Turn on the bedside light. Oh, I love you so. Darling, I want to help you. You know that, don't you? Of course. Frank, listen to me. Have you ever heard of Horace Gay? Not until Drake spoke of him. Who is he now? He's an escape convict in Sing Sing. He was sent up for murdering a man. Good heavens. What? Drake? I told Drake that Horace Gay and I were once in love. I told him that after the trial, Horace threatened to kill any man that I married. I mean, you don't mean that you... Of course not. I never heard of Horace Gay until I read about him in the paper. I cut out the clipping and mailed it to myself. But why in heaven's name? But don't you see why? I wanted Drake and everyone else to think that Horace Gay had come back and murdered Alan. But what if they... Capture Horace Gay? Oh, they won't, darling. That's how I was clever. The clipping came from a year-old paper. The police have practically given up searching for Horace Gay. Yes, it was clever. Very clever. But I'm oh, still... stop worrying, darling. Horace Gay is probably in South America by now. I'm not worrying. It's an ingenious idea. There's only one thing wrong. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I've taken care of that, too. Taken care of what? The gun, darling. Look, I kept it under my pillow. Do you mean that you... Of course. I fired the shot. There wasn't any prowler. And when Drake suggested that the prowler might have been Horace, I pretended I'd forgotten about him. Remember? Yeah, I remember. Well, if I had been the one who had suggested Horace, Drake might have thought it was a setup. Wasn't that clever? Very clever. What are you going to do with the gun? Oh, silly. If I'd thrown it out the window, where they would have found it with my fingerprints. No, darling, Drake must never find the gun. So you expect me to get rid of it for you? But darling, it's for your own good. You've already been searched. They'll never look. Oh, yes. yes, Frank? You... You think I killed Alan, don't you? Didn't you, Frank? Don't be a fool, of course I didn't. Frank? What? Come back here. Hello? Sit down here. I've been listening to me. You listen to me, Frank, darling. Listen carefully. Perhaps you didn't murder Alan. If you say you didn't, it's all right with me. But I didn't, I... All right, all right. Drake and Daphne think you did. They can't prove a thing. Johnny, Johnny, suppose you're wrong. Suppose they can prove that you did. What do you mean? It looks bad, Jack. You did have a motive. You did quarrel with Alan. 
your fingerprints were on the gun. You and I both have admitted we were in love. Ah, but, Helene, I tell you, that wouldn't stand up in court. It's, it's circumstantial. Alan was an important man, Frank. They've got to send someone up for his murder. And you think I'm the goer? Oh, darling, let's not take that chance. Ruth is practically convinced that this Horace Gay is the murderer. If they don't find the guy... Well, how will I get rid of it? What if they find it out? Well, they won't, darling. Don't let them. Oh, Frank. Thank goodness I see the way I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear it, darling. Pick up a drink and dance me. Oh, quick, darling. Put the gun in your pocket. Well, well, well. Look who's here. The little man who wanted everyone else to be so discreet about going into female bedroom. Look here, Danton. I'll have you know. We understand, Whitman. Becoming indignant won't help the situation. This is Fisher. I'll have to ask you to get dressed and come downstairs. I'm afraid I must disappoint you, Mr. Drake. I really don't feel up to it. And I'm afraid I haven't the time nor the patience to tolerate your disappointment, Mrs. Fisher. You will meet us in the living room in ten minutes. Now, just a minute, Drake. These high-handed methods of yours are a little too much to take. Are they, Whitman? And what do you plan to do about it? You see, Junior, we're not kidding. Mr. Drake, I absolutely refuse. If you do, Mrs. Fisher, we'll have a patrol wagon here in ten minutes. Inspector, perhaps you'd better assist Mr. Woodman down to the living room in case he has similar ideas about joining our party. It'll be a pleasure. Come on, little man. Come to Papa. Well, the ten minutes are up, Bart. Shall I call a wagon? Mm, we'll wait a moment or two longer, Inspector. In the meantime, Woodman, I think you'd better hand over the gun. What? What gun? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the gun that Mrs. Fisher used to shoot the hole through the screen, Woodman. It wasn't outside the house, and I'm sure that Mrs. Fisher wouldn't want it found in her room. But how? I mean, I haven't handed over, Junior. Well, I... Look here, you can't... Oh, can't... <laughs> it is, bud. <laughs> Just like we figured. Hmm. You see, Woodman, the ragged ends of the screen made by the bullet passing through pointed outward. That proves conclusively that the shot came from inside the room. Get it, Junior? Tell him what else we know, Bart. Very well, Inspector. We know that there was no man in Mrs. Fisher's room, Woodman. The whole thing was a product of her imagination. That's a lie. You can't pull a thing. I think we can. Mrs. Fisher said she woke up and saw the glowing dial of a man's wristwatch in the darkness. Well, how did she know it was a man's wristwatch? Why not a woman? I beg your pardon, Mr. Drake. Oh, yes, sir. Mrs. Fisher is waiting for you in the library. Library? We told her we'd be here in the living room. Mrs. Fisher prefers the library, sir. Oh, she's trying to show her independence, eh? Well, no. Oh, no, no, Inspector. Meeting us in the library is the cleverest move Mrs. Fisher's made tonight. But on the other hand, it's a dead giveaway that she is the one who murdered her husband. <laughs> Not at all, Mrs. Fisher. Say, stop me if I'm out of order, but aren't you dressed kind of funny, Mrs. Fisher? Funny, Inspector Dalton? Why? Well, wearing a riding habit this time of night with those heavy boots. I love riding clothes, Inspector Dalton. I never had a chance to wear them very much before I married Alan. That's a very nice act, Mrs. Fisher. I admire your courage. No, no, Louis. I think you'd better remain. (laughs) Very well, Mr. Drake, before we left the living room, you said that... Yes, yes, I know, I know. Louis... What was the real reason that you didn't remain in Mrs. Fisher's room after you turned on the light? Why, I... I was I, not in bed, that's why. Mr. Drake must you be so trying. What possible difference can it make? A great deal, Mrs. Fisher. You were not in bed. You've gotten up and run over to the screen door to unfasten the latch from the inside. Isn't that right? No. I've gotten up to chase the prowler. I've neglected to pick up my dressing gown, and Lewis... Nonsense, nonsense. When Lewis switched on the light, you were standing in the center of the floor. You made no effort to get back into bed. Isn't that right, Luke? Why? Why, yes, it is. Yes, of course. And why didn't you run back to bed, Mrs. Fisher? Why? Why, I... I'll tell you why. Because if you'd taken one step, Lewis would have known that you couldn't walk without limping. Limping? What the devil? Yes, limping. When you shot at your husband through the French doors, Mrs. Fisher, he didn't die instantly, as I told you before. He lived long enough to mutter that he got whoever shot at him, just as Woodman said. Helene. It isn't true. I don't believe it. Yes, it is true. Your husband shot back at you. He hit you in the leg, and you realized you had to cover that wound. Say, that's why she... Yes, Inspector, that's why she's been wearing riding boots all day. And every time we've seen her, she's either been lying down or sitting. Exactly. And that's why Mrs. Foster came down to the library. 
instead of the living room. She didn't want us to see her limping. Right. The gun. The gun that I gave you. Shoot them. Shoot them. Run. I'm sorry, Colleen. <laughs> Mighty nice of you to ask me to stay with you tonight, Bob. It would have been a long trip out to my place. Well, I'm glad to have your company, Inspector. Anything I can get for you? No, say. I think I'll go to sleep. Twin beds is sure nice. Huh. Say, uh, Bob. Yes, Inspector. Why did the babe dream up that Horace gay gag? Because we convinced her that we had enough evidence to send Woodman to the chair. That would have meant complete failure of her plan. She was in love with Woodman. So she tried to pin the murder onto someone else. Oh, I see. Well, good night. Good night, Inspector. Yeah, say, Bud. Yes, Inspector. It's something you forgot. Hmm? Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, Inspector. Mystery is my hobby. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining us for Mystery is My Hobby. I really enjoy the show. It's just kind of a, it's just a fun, sometimes corny, but fun show. We're glad you joined us tonight. But before you go, I just want to mention one more time the Johnny Dollar Club. In case you haven't heard, Johnny Dollar Club is where all the cool kids are hanging out. That's right. This channel is not an ad supported channel. We do rely on viewers like you to help keep us on the air. So for starting at just a dollar a month, you can join the Johnny Dollar Club, help support the channel, and also get access to exclusive content. How do you join? Well, check out the links in the description below. There's some in the chat and there's some in the comments. You can choose either patreon.com or buymeacoffee.com. Click on those links and see what level of support works for you. Now, if you go to buymeacoffee.com, don't forget to click on the membership tab. Remember, if you don't see Johnny's face, you're not in the right place. And of course, another way to support us is to buy us a strawberry. That's right. You can go to buymeacoffee.com and buy us a strawberry. If you've watched this channel for any length of time, you know that my daughter Ellie loves strawberries. <laughs> so you can help support the channel and help our daughter with her seemingly endless search for strawberries. <laughs> well, thanks so much for tuning in. Once again, I hope you enjoyed the